watching. Maybe they will be the only things that stick around, but if the wind picks up, they may also blow away. <laughs> My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Sebastian. And, well, hopefully our drive is going to be filled with a couple more animals than they were this morning. We really had a turtle dove to start off with, so that's a good sign. And I can also hear a woodpecker pecking in the distance. But this is live. This is interactive. It's happening right now. I'm not sure if the Mara team is going to be joining us today, perhaps a little bit later. Otherwise, myself and Tristan are out. So if you'd like to ask us any questions, you're more than welcome to. Hashtag support. Safari Live on Twitter, or you can have a chat to us on the YouTube chat too. Let's see if we can find this hoodpecker. Where is this hoodpecker? I've been listening to it peck, peck, pecking away. And now we've just got to see if we can find it. It's definitely on the marula tree, but now. Oh no, there it goes. Ha <laughs> ha, you're so funny. Did you see where it landed on that marula? Do you see that big marula over there yeah. in the fork? to the left, the, the main sort of fork, you'll see, you go into the middle of the tree and you'll see it straight away, are you going good? Uh, and then up here, up to the right a little bit, no, yeah, yeah, if you go straight and there it is, ha ha, woodpecker, you've got it, it's just up there if you look on the monitor, oh, it just dropped down, so it's got, uh, it's, no, it's gone, it's flown. I don't know what woodpecker that was, but it was woodpecker. The only way I was able to identify that it was a woodpecker was because it had some green on it and I did see a couple of white speckles. And I heard it pecking and the pecking has stopped. So I've put two and two together, makes sense that it was one. Maybe, uh, maybe the birds will be around at some point. Not right now though, however, I'm not sure what I'm going to be looking for. I think I would like to find some elephants today, a whole herd of them. That would be nice. Maybe some giraffe. I know there was a giraffe on the dam cam earlier today. That was quite cool because I'd actually said that I really wanted to see a giraffe. And then maybe we'll go past Chitwa and do some exploring around there. Seeing as though the wind has died down, it'll be nice to test the signal on a good day. But like I said, Tristan's also bumbling about. Let's go across to him and see if he's going to give leopard searching another bash. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to our Sunset Safari. As Taylor mentioned, my name is Tristan and on camera today I have got Senzo. Now, we are going to try and see if we can just drive around a little bit in the Gallego area to see if we can't find the sign of that leopard that Taylor saw very briefly this morning. That's going to be the plan at least. So if you do see anything on the dam cam, hashtag Safari Live, or you can let us know on the YouTube chat because I would imagine that this cat that was around here will at some stage start moving and maybe it will head towards the dam side. But you can also ask any questions and just get hold of us if you want to say hello on the same forums. Now I'm in the same area as where the drama unfolded last night. So we have the tree just above me here. That's where poor little Shongile was left when we departed the scene last night. She was perched high in those branches. Tandi and Hosanna over there and Tumba somewhere in this area as well. Now I wanted to come here just for two reasons. One is, like I say, because Taylor saw a leopard here this morning and, well, it just feels like a good place to start and maybe see if there isn't any sign. But the other reason I wanted to come here is I actually wanted to just have a little look around the tree and see what signs there were and what went on last night and whether or not Shongile came down and was able to move off without a scuffle because there should be signs of a scuffle if they did have one again after she came out of the tree. So I wanted to come and check. I haven't had a chance yet to walk around, but I can see there's tracks Oh, pug marks, whether they be hyenas or leopards, all over the place here. So I don't know if the hyenas also got involved here last night. It certainly remain to be seen. But the good thing is, is that there's no sign of any injured leopards still around this area. Taylor searched quite extensively around here. And there was no sign of any animal that was in distress or walking badly or in any way hurt. So that's a good thing. The fact that there's tracks moving in all different directions. And this morning we had such a sort of difficult time in trying to decode where all these footprints went is a very, very positive sign. And it means that at least the leopards all managed to get out of here and we won't have too many dramas, hopefully, from what happened last night. But what I'm going to do is I just want to quickly check. So those are mostly hyena tracks that are around there. I was hoping to see if there was maybe signs of both the females coming down into this area. But I see there's so many impalas have walked here that I think the tracks unfortunately have been walked all over. 
Right, I think what we're going to do is then let's carry on. And since there's nothing at Gallagher Pan right now, I'm going to head towards the hyena den and just park off there. And if I hear then any alarm calls, given the amount of prey animals that I've seen in this area, there's lots of bushbuck, lots of nyala, impalas all around Gallagher Pan. So if they see a leopard, they're certainly going to let us know, much like what happened yesterday with Tundi. So we'll just go sit near by, which is the den is not too far from here, and hopefully that will be active. And from there, we'll be able to hear any signs of these leopards being their presence being given away by alarm calls so that's going to be the plan i think what do you think senzo good plan good plan senzo says good plan but it is at least starting to warm up again it's it's still not quite what it was last week last week was beautiful weather it was warm and very pleasant and now it's at least the wind is dropping which is the big thing we had such bad wind the, the past two days and the wind has really made it difficult and hopefully with the, the dying down of the wind will mean things like elephants will start to come out a little bit and even the cats themselves will start to move around. The good news is that the Nkuma Pride is at least making its way slowly back this way. They were found now just come out of the Manuleti. They're lying on Buffel's hook. They're sleeping at this stage but at least they've started their southward journey which hopefully means that tomorrow morning we shall have some of them around as well. It will be nice if the Nkumas come back for a little bit of time. It was really good to see quite a bit of them last week with that buffalo kill, so I'm hoping that will be the case once again. The good thing also is that there's no trucks coming out here at all. We are where to you want to know how often do we see snakes around the park? Well, not that often. You'll be surprised. There are a lot of snakes here and they are everywhere. It's just that snakes are very perceptive creatures and they know that often big sounds and vibrations, which is what this car is causing as we're driving, is a danger and they'll then try and slither off. And once a snake gets into grass like this or even into the trees, they become very difficult to spot. But now is the time of the year that we should start to see the snakes. So as we come out of this winter period and we go into uh, to spring, which is September, October, you'll find that the trees still don't have many leaves, but because it's warmer, the snakes are fairly active. And then you find them sitting in the trees and particularly at night, if you've got a spot lights out you can shine into the trees and you'll be able to get these little glistening scales and it alerts you to their presence so we don't see them that often but they are a lot more than you would think out here there's all kinds of different species of snake that we see in this area so I'm gonna kind of have your wits about you when you are moving around here and certainly when you're walking you've got to pay attention where you're placing your feet because the adders are a nasty species particularly the puff adder and it's a species that doesn't actually move too much when you walk and you tend to stand on them quite a bit so you do have to be a bit careful in that regard but like I say they're masters of camouflage and masters of hiding in plain sight so even though we don't see many of them there are a lot here a little squirrel that dashed across the road unfortunately that squirrel will be long gone Ah, Sherry, you want to know another saga in the leopard drama that has been the last, I would say, two weeks, I suppose, not even ten days. You want to know whether or not there's an update on Shadow's injury. Sherry, unfortunately not. We have not seen any more signs of her. I've driven in that area. I know Taylor was there this morning. They've checked with the guys on the other side in Arethusa and Simambili, and they haven't found any sign of her as yet. It's not anything to stress about at the moment, because as we know with Shadow, well, as the name suggests, she spends a lot of time well hidden. So we sometimes go weeks and weeks and weeks and even months without seeing Shadow. So it's not uncommon for us not to see them. And even the guys on the Arethusa side, sometimes they also, I remember when I was at Simambili, we used to go three, four, five weeks, sometimes longer without seeing Shadow. So it's not too much of a stress just yet, but we certainly are still trying to keep an ear out and trying to ask around as much as possible to find out what she's up to and whether or not she's starting to come right or if that injury is still bad. But I can tell you that we haven't had any fresh signs since about three days after we saw her there which is maybe a positive thing maybe she's ended up getting her foot sorted and is now able to move around a lot better 
Right, now let's see if we have anybody home at the hyena den. I'm hoping so. It seems as though it's been a little quiet at the den. I know Taylor was here this morning and there was no sign of anybody home. Let's just quickly check this side first. They generally at the moment in the afternoons are on the other side where it's a bit shady. But we'll check this side first just in case. Oh, there's a stump. Let's try to get over that. Hmm. Doesn't look like anybody's home at this stage. There's a nice big bone that's been brought here though. That's a fairly new addition to the entrance to the den. You can see it just over there. That's the bone that we're talking about. So they would have been playing with that. Jerry, you're wondering who's the most successful predator here? Well, Jerry, that's, I suppose, a difficult answer. I think they all ebb and flow, and all of them have different sort of levels of success. I would say the hyenas are probably one of the most successful in terms of the predators, particularly to the west of us. We've got big clans of hyenas that are surviving there, and they seem to be able to thrive in these areas. This particular clan, not so much. They haven't thrived because of the presence of the Inkahumas last year. I think that limited their numbers and their growth quite a bit. But they're still probably the most successful. Leopards also in the Sabi Sands are very successful. We have a very high density of leopards, even though we've had a tragic last couple months with them. A number of the adults being killed by lions and all kinds of other things. And so it's been a bit tough for them but I would say probably hyenas are number one and then our leopards the lions funny enough have not been very successful in the Savi sands at all over the last few years and that is because we've had a number of coalitions come through and that means a lot of the cubs get killed before they reach adulthood and so the prides are just stagnating they're not growing in any way whatsoever right I'm going to just do a little loop around the den just to check if there isn't any sign of our hyenas on the other side of the den and while I do that I believe Taylor has been fighting with gremlins and she's back and ready to chat to all of you so let's see where she's been and what she's been up to we had some cable gremlins that were attacking the camera we have found some warthogs don't run Waties, wait for us. They're crossing the road just very slowly up ahead, so I'm just going to see if I can slowly cruise on and maybe we'll get a decent view of them. Where are you going? See, now the wind is starting to pick up. They've, they've also gone from a run to a walk, so we stand a chance now. Don't go behind that African wattle because then we're most certainly not going to be able to see you. They were just feeding out in the open and then they obviously heard us. And we know that most of the time the warthogs actually keep moving when they see us, but they're going, they're so still. Oh, maybe we have a chance. Hello, everyone, don't run, it's just us. There we go, that's better. I don't mind it when they walk away from us very slowly, that's okay. And it's never nice leaving a sighting with an animal darting away from you. But again, because of all the wind that we, we have got around, it's, it's better that the animals are slightly on the cautious side, because if you're too complacent in this wind, you could miss something and end up being, well, a meal for a predator. And they've done exactly what I didn't want them to do, is to go behind that massive African wattle. Okay, we'll carry on. So we passed Treehouse Dam. We dropped off a camera there. We took some pictures quickly uh, for for Sebastian. What are you doing? Change of seasons, is it for? Uh, yeah, time lapses. Hmm. So seasonal time lapses to have a look at what's going on. So, so that's what that's all about. That's why we're stopping at the the various sort of dams. It's it's you know it's too fire break drive. I don't like to drive on Gowrie Main. It's too bumpy. So we'll go down this way. This is going to bring us out to Treehouse Dam eventually, and we'll have a quick squiz around there. And then I'm going to check sort of around Ledwood, Mumba, some of these roads, hoping to find some elephants. They're spending a lot of time around there. Maybe even Batalier Road and search about. It would be nice to find a big herd of elephants or chitwa. Now, Annabella, you're wondering what is my favorite animal on, the, on a safari and why? Well, it's the animals that we're searching for at the moment. It's the elephants. And the reason why I enjoy them so much is it, they've got very sort of human-like qualities. Now, it, it's difficult when you're watching on screen, but when you're surrounded by the largest mammal on land, and they're enormous, and they come around your car and you have the little ones, you know, playing about or an adult sniffing right near your feet, that type of thing. It's a very sort of humbling experience to know that the largest animal on land could quite easily, if they wanted to, turn us upside down. 
they don't. They we have this amazing respect for one another, and obviously that's just taken a lot of time. Um, eventually to get like that and, and it's just so much to f fun to watch them they're always doing something and now we've got a giraffe there's another car here so I just want to quickly join the sighting a station with a giraffe to dance can I join please copy thanks Ralph wonderful so we can go ahead it's just Ralph that's up ahead no other cars so even for an even though it's just a giraffe, we of course will still make sure that there's not too many cars because we don't want to sort of pressure the animals at all. So once I go over this little bump, I'm actually going to switch a car off and we're going to freewheel into the sighting. Try and be as quiet as possible, although the wind should be much quieter. Not that they really mind the sound of the cars, but I don't want to disturb the sighting for the guests. That's Ralph, what I'll do, Seb, is I'll try to pull off over here car in the shop. Come on Wendy. No, of course you're not. You silly Wendy, you don't know how to be quiet, do you? Yeah, it's an old bull. We've seen this fella, I think, a couple of times. In fact, and um, just because of that bare patch of skin on his neck, which we'll have a look at in a moment. But he's a old fella, this one. But this is the southern giraffe. So it's not the giraffe species that you're seeing in Kenya, the Maasai giraffe. And they're not quite as big as the Maasai giraffe, the southern giraffe. They're pretty big, though. I'm just feeding on some quarries. Yum. Dear watcher, you exclaimed, yay, giraffe. Well, that's how I felt, because I was so surprised to see that there was one on the dam cam uh, earlier today. And like I said, because that was the one animal I said I'd really like to have a look at. I just haven't seen a giraffe, and I did see them while I was on holiday. I actually, I saw lots and lots of giraffe. Uh, it was quite interesting, though. So when I was just very briefly visiting the Mapungupwe National Park, uh, I found lots of giraffe and there's plenty of them there. There's not a lot of cats in that area. Uh, and this is, of course, a male giraffe. And you can see that the first thing is just because how dark his coat is. And then he's also got no hair on the top of his Aussie cones, those little horn-like protrusions from his skull. But the giraffe in Mapungupwe... Well, unlike the giraffe, a wildebeest's horns are all made of hair. And we're right on the edge of the migration. And they are funny-looking beasts, aren't they? The wildebeests or gnus, in this particular case, the white-bearded gnu. Now, they've all spread out the herds in compared to uh, when I was out on Saturday morning. They were far more condensed, but they're making short work of this grass up on the ridges around Serena. Now, remember, this is 100% live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya and Juma in South Africa. And, of course, for those of you who don't know, my name is Brent Leo Smith, and I'm going to be your guide uh, while we travel through the marvelous Mara. And if you want to ask us any questions, remember, hashtag Safari Live is the best way to get hold of us, and you can do that on Twitter. Now, uh, we are in search of the Egyptian goose pride of lions, which tend to frequent this area. I've spent some wonderful time with them over the last couple of weeks as we have been following them alive through the migration. And actually, last Saturday morning, uh, we spent time with them. It was just over the ridge, a little bit to the right of where Manu is showing you now. And yes, Manu is on camera with me. And it looks like there's some striped donkeys there in the background. Moikram is wondering, uh, so wildebeest and gnus are the same. Indeed, they are the, the same. Uh, it just depends in what part of Africa you're from. Wildebeest is traditionally from, well, actually, the where they first get their name from is from Dutch. When the first Dutch uh, sailors stopped in the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, uh, I think one of the first animals they encountered, now this is a my theory, it's not fact, but I haven't found any better theory, the first animal they encountered were wildebeest, and it basically translated from Dutch, wilde, wild beast, beast. A wild cow could be wild beers, beast. A beers is a cow, wildebeest, and it's slowly been changed over the years. So uh, that's probably where the name comes from. 
and uh, and the GNU name that they have in lo- large parts of East Africa, of course, these ones are being rather silent because I want them to go GNU uh, is from the sound they make. Oh dear, I'm causing a bit of a traffic jam here. Now, we're going to go back to Taylor so she can finish telling you about Gerald the Giraffe's hairless ossicones. Let's go around. All right, hello everyone. Sorry that we disappeared so quickly before. And we're just trying to catch our giraffe friend again. There seems to be a couple of gremlins on board today. We'll get him again now. I just need to take the scenic way around. I'm just on the fire break. And then we're going to pop out onto Gary Man. And I think we might actually anyway and see if we... Whee! It's a bit bumpy there. Um, hopefully we'll be able to find some elephants around that way. But let's have a quick look at our friend again. He's coming this way, so we might catch him. Whee! Let's go through here. Now, JC, just as we make our way back to the straw, you're wondering if they fight over territories. So it's quite interesting with giraffe. They don't actually hold territories. They don't mark and defend them like we see with lions and leopards and, and a variety of other animals. Uh, they sort of they're, they're home ranges. So typically what a home range is, is it's sort of an area that they occupy, but it, it can change. It depends, of course, where the food is, where the water is. So they constantly will, will move around. Um, and, and even with the, the cows, the, the females, they hang together, but they don't necessarily stay together for their whole lives. They'll, you know, come and go, join different herds. It's a very sort of loose social structure. And the big bulls, like this fella over here, because he's a, he's a mature man, um, he will actually uh, move from herd of females to females, testing all of the cows to see if any of them are in estrus. And obviously if two big bulls of equal size, sometimes it's not always an equal battle, uh, they'll come together and end up sort of bumping heads quite literally uh, in order uh, to claim the stake and be able to mate with the females that are in estrus in that particular herd. But he's not worried about that at the moment. He's taken some time to himself and it's quite common to see giraffe bulls on their own like this. I mean sometimes you'll even see a female with a youngster off on their own in the thicket. But I suppose he's theoretically he's not alone. He's got ox peckers in his ears. <laughs> Long tongue. Really stretching out, using that tongue and bringing in some leaves. Also just very carefully looking around. Now, Olivia, a question from you this afternoon. You're wondering if the lions take down giraffe and the sabi sand. Uh, not necessarily. I know the Charleston males, uh, which are two beautiful uh, males. One is quite famous because he's got one of his canines dangling from uh, his lower jaw and that injury is actually suspected from a, a giraffe that they, they took down. There's many different stories uh, but that's the one that I've heard time and time again and it actually happened while I was down there uh, guiding in the south too. So they do occasionally uh, I have heard of uh, some prides around Singita the, one of the really large super prides of lions. You can imagine when you've got more than 20 lions in a pride one buffalo is not going to go very far. So you have to take the next step and start going for things like giraffe. But it takes a lot of practice. It's not a particularly easy animal to hunt. And I feel like they need a lot of sort of training. And there's obviously certain techniques that need to be used. And if it's your first time hunting a giraffe, we see the Nkuhumas showing interest in these tall creatures all the time. But we have yet to see them take one down. They often chase them around but very dangerous for lions. But if you go up to Namibia, their lions are specialists there again. Zimbabwe, they specialize in hunting not only giraffe, but also young elephant bulls. And I'm sure that similar things happen all over, uh, all over Africa, in fact, but not in this particular area, but it's not impossible either. Uh, they'll definitely take the chance if they can. Remember, with lions, they want to catch something. They want to catch the biggest animal that they physically can, so they don't have to hunt straight away. If it means they can feed off it for a week, They'll be so excited about that. But I think this giraffe has probably had a you know, few encounters with lions in his life. Remember, they, don't, they won't use that long neck, of course, to, to try and chase the lions away. That's what they're using when they're fighting. They swing their, their heads at each other. And if you go all the way down to the bottom, where they use those powerful legs. And they'll chop with their front feet 
it's actually it's quite intimidating when you see an angry giraffe having a go at lions, and then of course they have powerful hindquarters, and they can kick back, and that could quite easily kill a lion if it connected in the wrong spot. Now this is a beautiful feather. He, feather. he often hangs around the Voyatilla uh, Dam. Now, Laura, you're wondering if the giraffe, or some giraffe, sorry, have that light color at the top of their heads for a specific reason or if it's sort of uh, just a genetic variation. I reckon it's, it's specific. I mean, you actually see it with most of the giraffe, typically around the ears and the, and the top of the head. It's quite light. I'm not sure why, if it has a specific reason. Um, that's, that's quite interesting, in fact. You don't normally see it too much with the, with the females. The females are typically lighter in color, but we have seen on a number of different occasions an occasional uh, dark cow that will uh, sort of make you second-guess yourself when it comes to trying to sex it from a distance. Uh, but I don't think there's any particular reason for it. I don't think I've ever really read about there being a significance for the lighter part around their heads. Maybe it's helping with camouflage because you can see in between their legs as well. It's quite light. Perhaps that helps break up the figure. We know that different colors and different patterns definitely do help in disruptive markings when it comes to camouflaging themselves. And even a giraffe to an extent uh, needs to be camouflaged. There we go. You can see those lighter, those lighter patches. So I'm not sure if it's just a coincidence. But this is a particularly sort of pretty boy when it in terms of his color. Of their calls actually. Shame this fella hasn't got the straightest little Aussie cones, has he? They're sort of pointing in all sorts of directions. But he's just enjoying some leaves at the moment. The ox peckers also stood around on him. But one has just flown off, so I wonder if the other two are going to follow and head elsewhere. I wonder what determines uh, the length of stay of ox peckers on particular animals' backs always wondered that and sometimes you know you'll see them sitting on an animal for the whole day other times they're jumping from mammal to mammal within a herd sometimes they land on the back of one I suppose if they get a swat and they connect the tail connects the bird they're not going to hang around there for too long they'll probably move off but I love watching that it sort of reminds me of I don't know why uh, you know old-fashioned typewriter and as you type in I don't know you see I don't even know what the correct words are but uh, you you know the thing with the ink maybe you said you can help me how it sort of shuffles to the side i apologize i'm just showing my angel seb also know he also doesn't know what it's called but when they do that with their bills that's all i just hear that i don't know why i hear that they're one of the coolest birds out here now, Zedric, you're wondering if giraffe are relatively intelligent. Well, I think all animals out here have to have some form of intelligence to be able to survive and, and you know, in this harsh world out here because it's not the easiest living conditions. It's quite stressful constantly watching over your shoulder, especially if you're a prey species. And then again, if you're a predator, looking out for other predators, whether they're the same species or others, you know, a lot of these animals do show problem-solving ability. So I reckon, I reckon and they're fairly intelligent. I don't think they have the intelligence level, however, of an elephant. Um, but maybe, maybe, you know, I think that they're all right. But their communication is very different, of course. Uh, they use body language to communicate most of the time from long distances. And then, of course, we recently discovered that they hum, which is interesting. Isn't that cool? Now Tesla, who is only seven years old, one of our younger viewers, is wondering how fast can a giraffe run? Well, it depends, Tesla, if it's running downhill and it's got the wind behind it. And then they, you'd be surprised how quick they can actually go. But one thing that I want to quickly chat about is that if you've ever been fortunate enough to drive next to a giraffe while it's walking, you'll, if you look down at your speedometer, you'll notice that you're going quite Well, unfortunately, the gremlins, as we know, around Twin Dams and Mulawati have overrun Taylor. So you're back with me. Now, 
No sign of anything at the hyena's end. We did do a loop around the back. There was nothing there. I've now come along on Vubu Road just to check if anything walked here. Nothing on this side either. So it's been a little quiet. We haven't found too much at all. Not, nothing in the way of birds either. So hopefully our luck will start to change as we head a little bit. I've just been informed that there is tracks for a young male leopard on Philemon's Dip. Now I would be interested to know whether they're on top of all the vehicles because I think Taylor went there this afternoon to drive in that direction which means that those tracks if they're on top are about as fresh as fresh could be so that would be quite nice so we're gonna head to that area and try and see if we can't track down one of our little spotted cats friends and see which young male has decided to walk there I would imagine given the route that it's walking my idea would be Hosanna that's who I think it would be but you never know, Tumba could also easily walk that way. They are all over the place at the moment, these youngsters, so it's difficult to say who is where. It's interesting though that I, it must be the same cat that was at the dam cam at around five o'clock this morning because that cat did not go further south. We could not find any tracks further south going down in the drainage. It must have cut across towards Inga's and then across quarantine and down that way. That's the route it must have taken because there's most certainly was no sign in the drainage. I walked all over the place there trying to look. There was old tracks but nothing from this morning. Oh, there's one of our... F oh, no, don't fly away. <laughs> it's going to be one of those afternoons. Every time I try to stop for a bird, they fly away this afternoon. So maybe birding is not for me this afternoon. Who knows? We shall persevere though. We won't let them get the better of us. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me, Senza? <laughs> Muska, you're wondering if Saleh left behind any cubs? No. So Tiani is completely independent now. Saleh just mated with Anderson about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I think. So potentially she could have been pregnant, but she'd be right in the early phases if she was. Um, but no, she doesn't have current cubs at the moment, which is at least some sort of semblance of good out of the bad situation of, of her dying. We haven't heard anything about her necropsy, and I, I doubt that we will. And it's, at the end of the day, it's been weekend, and it will also take a bit of time for a lot of the blood work to be tested and for the results to come back. It's not going to be an instant process where all of a sudden you're going to just have, you know, a result straight away, unless it's a very obvious thing. If it's something to do with blood work, that's going to take a little bit of time. So as soon as we get an update, we will let you know. You can see that is the dam, Gauri Dam, which is drying at a rate that is really unbelievable. It's, it's amazing how much smaller it is than it was a few weeks ago. It, it's crazy to... I remember having an elephant sighting here and the water stretched way up on the other side and even around this side here you couldn't drive anywhere near the dam wall to get around and now there's a lot of mud you could easily negotiate that to get around so I don't know if this dam is actually going to last all the way into the summer I feel we may just see Gauri Dam drying up before the summer is out or before the summer gets here and the rains arrive Certainly if we have a lot of hot temperatures like we had last week and wind, we're going to get a lot of evaporation that's going to take that all away. James, you're wondering about updates and, and the leopards and whether or not there's been any updates on Mvula. Now, not at this stage, James. I haven't heard anything. The last time I heard an update on Mvula was... Oof, where are we now? We're now on Sunday afternoon, so it would have been, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, somewhere there. He was seen on the west, so around Arethusa Samambili side, and then he crossed our side. I can't remember what day that was. It was one of the days where I was with Tumba. He crossed this way, and then his tracks went up towards Buffalo's Hook, and that night they saw him at about 10 o'clock at night. So it was Wednesday or Thursday, maybe, somewhere there. So he is around. Taylor said to me this morning she saw tracks of a male leopard on the fire break close to Gallagher's shortcut, which uh, it could be Tingana, but that is a very common place for Mvula to walk. So I wouldn't be surprised if Mvula went that way. It really is a, a route that he often takes. And she said that the tracks went down towards Aubrey's and then westwards. So maybe he's crossed back into Arethusa. He seems to take that path. He seems, seems to come down Aubrey's over where to access power lines and then westwards from there into Arethusa and Simabili. 
But quiet at the dam. I thought they would maybe see a few more birds. There's not even an Egyptian goose or a hardy dar, which is quite strange. Generally, we find in those areas lots of both that are around the water. Maybe something disturbed everybody during the day today. I don't know if there was anything at the dam. I saw some giraffe tracks there, which would, I think there was a giraffe around. So maybe that's what spooked everybody, but I doubt it. A giraffe is not exactly a ferocious beast that is going to go pick off Egyptian geese one by one. Claudia, are you wondering how I expect the animals to act to the, the eclipse. Well, I, I would imagine that they won't care in the slightest, really. It's so short a period for them that they don't really worry about it. I think you'll find that everybody will just kind of take a bit of notice and then not worry about it for that much longer. You might find the odd predator try and do something in the more dingy light, but I doubt there would be really too much that goes on. It's not exactly like it goes completely dark and almost night-like. It's just, you know, it just becomes a little darker. So I don't think it would really affect too much of what goes on. Um, I certainly haven't seen anything in the eclipses that have been around in the past. I haven't seen too much in the way of it affecting behavior. Like I say, it just doesn't go for long enough to, to really affect behavior in any way. I think if you had a total blackout and everything went completely dark all of a sudden, yes, then I would think that you would find our animals utilizing it, particularly the predators. But I don't think in any way we would see a situation that it changes just for an eclipse. No, I just want to see quickly. Nope. I thought there might be tracks there, but it was just tracks for a vervet monkey. Right, now it sounds like Taylor's had her wish this afternoon. She's found everything that she wants to find. She's had her giraffe, and now apparently she's got the colossal grey beasts making their way towards Chitra Dam. We were lots and lots of elephants, but I need to just watch them. So Megan, I do apologize. I may actually have to do some maneuvering as some of the cows in this herd seem to be slightly stressed and I don't know what's got them so worried. Hey big girls, there's some big, very, very, very big elephant cows here. Can I actually just point out the one that I think is this biggest is this old bird back here. She's just, I don't know if you can see her. No, you won't see her now. Hello guys, where are you off to? What's wrong? What have you heard? Walking right past the car, in front, behind, Hello, big girl. There's the old cow I was telling you about. I suspect that this is the matriarch over here. Hello, girl. Hello. It's okay. Just having a smell? Yeah. It's relax, relax, relax. Something has got them slightly worried. There they go. Past us. Here's a young bull showing us a slight agitation, but I'm really not worried about him. He could be one of the reasons, in fact, why this herd is a bit on the annoyed side. Um, He's not particularly young. He hasn't got the biggest ivory, but he's very tall. He's got long legs like a runway model. And maybe what he's been doing is he's been going about checking all the females, maybe pushing and shoving some of the youngsters around. Because you can see they've all moved away from him completely and they, they keep dodging his, his direction. But the cows will not stand for that, especially that matriarch at the back there. She is huge. She is the size... She's actually even bigger than that bull. No, uh, no, no, this one here, that one. That's the big one, that's a big car there. There's two really big ones, but I think that that girl, there she goes, she's just walking. You can see how she's still smelling all the vehicles around them. It's not really stopping to feed at the moment. They've obviously been given the command, go, go, go. Oh, that's so beautiful, look at that, Seb. It's hard because they're on the move, so we're gonna have to keep moving too. Isn't that a lovely scene? So yes, I'm exceptionally happy. After this morning's very quiet drive, within the first hour of the show, I've managed to find all the animals that I wanted to find. Should we go around, Seb? Okay. We're going to try. Um, I think our signal should be all right because we're up top here. We're not going down towards the dam. But we can give it a bash, and hopefully the gremlins don't get us. They look like they're starting to settle down now just a little bit. You know, most of the time the elephants are so relaxed and so calm. It's all right to have a day like today, you know, where you're slightly agitated. It's not a problem. We all have our bad days. This morning I was horribly grumpy because the hyena kept me awake. 
and then I had a nap this afternoon like a little kid and now I feel better. <laughs> that was very funny this morning, those leopards were very, very rude to us. I'm not looking for leopards today. So I'm just trying to think what our best spot's going to be. Might have to go around again. <laughs> No, Jacqueline, you said you can't imagine how cool it would be to be in a vehicle with me and, and being surrounded by all these elephants. Well, maybe not being with me, but being with the elephants is amazing. It's so cool. They're kicking up the dust. Look at that. That's so nice. So normally one of the ways that we spot the big buffalo herds when they've moved into the area is mostly we just follow the dust clouds. Uh, and it seems today we can do the same thing with the elephants. Now, I don't know if this is maybe the same herd of elephants, or one family, sorry, or if it's perhaps two or three different families that have joined up together, because that's not uncommon to see in these drier seasons. Often the animals come together and they'll move through and sort of graze and browse a particular area until there's not much left, and then they move on again and, and look for something else, sort of just as they do in, in Kenya with the big migrations. We normally only see this in the winter months in this area. Now they're going again. They're going straight back towards Gowry, Maine. And we might actually have to go all the way around, can you believe it, and go and wait for them there. Because they're really moving through at quite a pace. But this isn't the most relaxed herd. You know, I love it when they come around the vehicle and they're spending time feeding. <coughs> Excuse me. Then it's really quite nice. And you can't always get what you want. And like I said, if an elephant herd is having a bad day, that's fine. That doesn't happen very often. She's got long tusks, that girl, though. Sort of very needle-like tusks that would be very good for digging. And her young st just standing by, so not stopping for a swim. Literally going down, having a couple of trunkfuls of water. And then that's it. It hasn't been very hot, so, you know, they, they don't need to drink as much water. On the, on the days that it's, it's not very hot, they will be getting some of the moisture from the vegetation that they're feeding on. Oh, I wonder where they're going to go next. Maybe we'll, we'll find another herd that's slightly more relaxed, though. But you see how they're getting left behind? Now, one thing that is very, very dangerous are these satellite parties, the ones that, you know, stop to sort of feed. The rest of the herd has now moved on completely, and you'll come across something like this. Well, you think that it is just mom and calf and there are no other elephants around and you get in between them and the main herd, you can find yourself in a lot of trouble. So try and avoid that, especially if you're on foot in a car, slightly different. They're not too worried about us, about us in the vehicles, but on foot you'll get, you will get a big fright. But we'll see if we can relocate on this herd. We'll go towards Gowry, Maine. I'm going to send you across to Brent now, who seems to be sitting at a river. Well, not only a river, the river, the murderous Mara looking actually quite still and tranquil for once. And we have a grey heron basking in the sun and a hippopotamus playing hide and, go, hide and seek behind that fallen... Uh, oh, what tree is that? I think it looks like a fallen... Hmm. It is indeed a fallen ebony. I have a little diospirus. But this part of the, the Mara River far more sort of sedate than the crossing points. And one of the reasons the wildebeest don't like crossing here is due to the forest on the other side. So all sorts of terrible things could wait for them in the forest on the other side. So the wildebeest tend to try cross where it's more open on both sides. Now, speaking of the wildebeest, Betty is wondering when does the migration end? Well, that changes every single year, Betty, depending on local rainfall, but it normally moves out of the Mara sometime in September and starts heading south for, into Tanzania, and uh, they will then stop again for a while around the southern plains of the Serengeti uh, for the birthing season, and that's where most of those wildebeest calves are birthed. Then they head through into the western corridor around the Grameti River. Here's some Egyptian geese grazing on the grass on the riverbank and then they'll start heading back north up towards the Mara again. Now, strangely enough, seeing that Egyptian goose, uh, when I was looking for the Egyptian goose pride of lions, um, they had caused some murderous mayhem around a waterhole and there were a lot of carcasses 
and we actually saw three or four Egyptian goose feeding on the undigested grasses that uh, the wildebeest from the wildebeest stomach. So that shows you that absolutely nothing goes to waste, even though the lions might kill more than they can eat and leave it. Even the undigested grass is going to get eaten by something. Uh, well, Egyptian geese are great grazers, but of course uh, we also saw all sorts of insects, harvested termites, uh, that will also take advantage of that undigested grass that comes out of the stomach of a slain wildebeest or zebra. Now I was hoping we might see, I can hear, where are you? I was hoping we might get a, a few little wading bird species about here. But alas, just uh, the waddling Egyptian goose and uh, the basking grey heron. Now if we look on, there's the grey heron, but if we look on the mud bank, Lynn, there we go, that is a grey heron. Uh, and Lynn was wondering. But if we look here, you can see the river's dropped a little bit over the last few days. We had quite a bit of rain. And if we look onto this mud flat next to us here, I've got a question for all of you. Ha, 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 ha. So let's zoom in on the mud flat. Uh, uh, the mud flat closest to us. There we go. That's it. Zoom in. Now, there's lots of little tracks. Now, the majority of those tracks are made by one animal. And I wonder if anyone can tell me what animal it is. If you know which animal has made those footprints, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter to let us know. Let me go. Let me sh oh, There's a tree that is very beautiful here in the Mara. I'm just going to try and move back a tiny bit. And uh, it is slight in East Africa, and that's obviously due to the minerals and whatnot. In Southern Africa, that's generally got a far, far paler bark, uh, much sort of more yellowy green. And uh, I've noticed here they often much darker green. There we go. And there's a fever tree. Roshni, close, but no cigar. Those footprints are not made by a stork. And so there we go. And we've got, oh, it looks like... P. Hart, you are spot on. It is indeed Egyptian goose. But now, one of the interesting things that you noticed with this fever tree, um, which is very different from southern Africa, is that there's not a lot of salinity uh, in the areas that grow in this part of East Africa. But in southern Africa, there often is. So they will sacrifice a branch and they'll pump all the salts and, 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 and not nice minerals into that branch and, uh, and then they will sacrifice that branch and it'll fall off. Oof, there's a bird, you see it, Manu? There you go, a little dark capped bulbul. If you come out in the fever tree. No, I just come, come out wide. It's on the far left hand side on one of the dangling branches. So there we go, zoom, zoom, you are there. Uh, a little bit up. Here we go, see, there we go. Is he gone now? No, he's still there. Okay, so zoom in slightly to the right. And you see the movement. There he is. Little, look like a dark cap bulbul. And he's very well camouflaged. Ah, and you notice in that foreground, there's a little creeper. And it's very different leaves from the rest of the tree. Now, that is a rhesus vine, one of the Bushman's grapes. And I can just tell that by the shape of the leaves. Now, some of the rhesus vines can be very important if you're ever stuck out in the African bush because uh, the bigger species of rhesus are the water vines that you can chop open with your machete and drink crystal cool water straight out of. Fortunately, I've got my water bottle, so I won't be needing to suck on the tiny rhesus vine straw. And in the dark cap bubble, he's waiting for some insects to appear. But while we wait patiently to see what else comes along here in the magnificent Mara, let's go to Tristan with the most numerous antelope in Africa, south of the Sahara.
Well, we've managed to find our most common antelope. If not anything else, at least we found these guys, which is a better sort of start to the day than what we had this morning. I don't think we even saw an impala this morning, or maybe one or two of them, but not many. Now, the tracks that we have for Hassan, or a young male leopard, like I say, I think it's Hosanna, but it could be Tumba. They go off right where these impalas are, just behind me. They cut off in a southeasterly direction as though they're heading towards Pangolin trackside. So they're following this drainage that runs along. Now, unfortunately, I can't track much further because of some large gray beasts that are inside here. So I'm going to try and see if I can't get round in some way and see if the tracks don't come out on the other side but it looks like they've gone into the drainage and I wonder if maybe, just maybe, these leopards are hearing vehicles and after yesterday's drama, a little bit on the shy side today, they're just trying to lay low and that's why they keep kind of moving off the road and why Taylor struggled this morning to keep up with that leopard and how it lost her so quickly. So it also could be the reason. The impalas themselves don't look too phased by what's going on. They're certainly not too worried about the leopard tracks at this stage maybe they this leopard went through long ago and it is not too much of a threat i can't see if they were on top of taylor's tracks or not because there's been two other vehicles that drove there so it, it seems as though they came out and that they're fairly fresh but it's anyone's guess given that a number of vehicles have been up and down they certainly have been driven over at least once but they look good so Maybe we'll be in luck this afternoon. We'll find one of the cats somewhere close by. I want to just check. There is that mud wallow or pangolin track that we often find. Well, we used to find Shungi then Hosanna moving towards. So I want to go just quickly check there. Obviously, Chella Pan, Twin Dams, Treehouse. Even though Taylor's checked them, you never know. Maybe that leopard's still en route to one of those and we get, end up catching up with it at some point. The other thing, of course, is it could be lying right here and watching these impalas, and we just can't see it, which wouldn't surprise me either if that was the case. See, there's quite a few males in this herd as well, so even though we might have had a second rut recently, that would be probably coming to an end now. It's starting to get very late in the season for any rutting or mating behavior, so the males will be far more tolerant of one another, and that's why you'll find them moving around in amongst the herd and being quite tolerant of each other. Both of those males are also quite young males, so you would have found that in the beginning, in the first rut, right at the beginning of the mating season, those are two individuals that probably wouldn't have got to look in, just given the fact that they are a little bit smaller than some of the other impalas that we get here, and they might have been pushed away, and now only towards the end of the season, when lots of lost condition, do they get a look in and able to mate. Right. Let's go around and see if we can't find any sign of this leopard coming out. I have a sneaky suspicion it's just lying somewhere in this drainage section, which is always what we say when it comes to leopard, but it's true. They do like drainage lines. We saw yesterday, even with all of those leopards that we saw there, it was all revolving around eroded drainage sections, and a lot of them were hidden in that, and it was difficult to negotiate, and so it's the perfect place for leopards. They like to move around in there. It's dense, it's thick, it's often quieter, and so it makes the perfect foil if you're an ambush predator to move around on the banks of those riverbeds. Hmm. I wonder, though, because, like I said, this morning, I'm just trying to think if I drove here this morning, I did the other road, I didn't take Pangolin track, which means that I suppose they could have been here this morning and, and that these tracks are not as fresh as one would want them to be. I don't see anything coming out on this side so far. It's obviously not in front of me here. Tracks coming out. It's been a leopard mission today. It's, there's just been tracks everywhere and between Taylor and myself, we've covered pretty much every road on Juma and 90% of them, I think, has had a leopard track on them from last night or today. So it's been a tough challenge, that's for sure. And like, I wonder, as I was saying earlier, if they're not just a little bit shy and they hear the cars coming and they're just slinking off into thickets and that's why we're battling to find them a little bit. It could be that that is the case after yesterday's chaos and the cars moving around and they just now know that cars bring attention to them and for a few days just want to lie low. That is very possible.
Zahova, you say that it seems as though the leopards have been come ghosts after the last two encounters so I presume you're talking about the Tumba Tingana encounter and then the the leopards last night encounter well I mean, it's not uncommon you, you're talking about young leopards so Tumba, Shongile, Hosanna these are all individuals that are not dominant and they they're not big enough to stand up for themselves just yet and so confrontation like this is difficult for them they don't know what's going on they're confused they don't want to get hurt they're just trying to stay low and trying to stay out of the way and so it's not uncommon in that situation for them just to try and get out of the way, try and not attract attention to themselves and try and stay as quiet as possible and move around without being detected. So it's not a surprise to me in any way. If big males or big females, a little bit different, I wouldn't expect them to be too shy about moving around. So Tingana, I doubt that he's being shy after you last night he'll or even after the tumba situation he just roams so far that's why we haven't found him and as for tundi well tundi's elusive at best so she's not like a, a leopard that we find daily and easily she's one that we requires quite a bit of work and we tend to bump into at random times in random places so it's not uncommon to see younger leopards behave in this particular fashion Hmm, all right, so no tracks that I can see coming out. Uh, of course, I haven't been paying as much attention as I probably should have because I've been talking too much, which is pretty normal. So I don't see anything coming out. Let's just check to make sure they didn't cross towards Chelapan. No, nothing crossing this side by the looks of it, which would mean that this leopard must be somewhere on our left-hand side, which is good and bad it's good because so far we can't see any sign of it coming out bad because that is not a place that is easy to find a leopard it's very dense very thick in there and i've tried to follow tingana through there before and it was an absolute nightmare in fact i don't think we even lasted five minutes with him we ended up losing him so that's not going to be a pleasant experience but we'll try and see what we can do i just wanted to check and make 100 percent sure on this side and then i'm going to do Ingwe Alley, which is, I suppose, appropriately named Leopard Alley, and see if they're not lurking there somewhere. And if nothing there, then we'll just have to walk on those tracks one more time and see if I can't find anything in the riverbed. Hopefully somebody will come and give us a hand, because even this morning we had no other vehicles aiding us, and it's nice sometimes when we get the other vehicles because they drop their trackers off and their trackers can walk between the roads while we're driving and while we're talking to all of you and trying to sort things out and trying to find the animals they can at least concentrate on it while we can look at other things okay no tracks coming out that i can see let's go across to taylor mccurdy who's still at chitra dam and i'm sure there's lots going on there and far more than what i've had this afternoon it's actually fairly quiet now since the elephants have left we're looking at a giant kingfisher and i've also just spotted a crocodile but we'll get the crocodile in a minute, don't worry. We might have to reposition, but it's swimming the length of Chitwood Dam. But here's a bird that we don't get to see every single day. And, well, the best spot to actually find the giant kingfisher is here at Chitwood Dam. We normally see pied as well. And I'm surprised we haven't seen any malachites. Uh, you can see, of course, brown and striped and, and grey-headed. They will be around here. But this is the largest one that we get to see. So for all of you who have just started your bird lists add it on let us know hashtag safari live with what number bird this is for you but it's busy at the moment not bothered by us sitting across the way it's got its eyes focused into the water hoping that a little tilapia or perhaps a barbel will come to the surface of the water but they don't just eat fish they also eat crabs and i'm sure that there's some freshwater crabs around here they'll go for little invertebrates so a lizard you know if there's a baby water monitor or something along the edge i don't think that they would say no to uh, a tasty snack like that but there are a couple of other birds i'll keep an eye on it to see if it does dive down if you go down to the right on that little sort of opening there's lots of water thick knees they're just basking in the warm light look at that reflection from the water on them better close your eyes that can't be too good for your eyes and they've got large beady eyes too but they're predominantly nocturnal so they're not really too active during the day i suspect they've probably just come out of the shadows now uh, just to warm up and then as soon as dusk falls upon well the earth they'll start moving around looking for things to eat and that's not all that's here we might as well do all the birds just walking past the car 
is a little pied lapwing. A nice species, not a lapwing, a pied lapwing. Come on now, Taylor, wagtail. And then I can also hear lots of commotion from the hippos, but we'll try and get there in a moment. They're very pretty birds. They've got striking colours, but not staying a lot, uh, around for too long. Just a quick sort of hello. Yeah, and that seems to be all for the birds now. I can't see any cutthroat finch. Now, we're in an awkward spot because I can clearly hear and see some ripples of the water and can hear lots of splash splashing. We need to go over there. Okay. Ca oh, no, we're in low range. Kathy said that the kingfisher was number 300 and... 323 or 323? 123. Very nice. So I'm not going to go too far forward just because I know that there's lots of gremlins, but just moving enough that we can see the hippos. Lots of hippos out in the open. I think that they're happy that the wind is not particularly strong at the dam today because they were fighting waves yesterday, creating waves and also fighting waves. That's what the hippos sometimes tend to do. But of course now the action has stopped as a youngster with its bottom out of the water. So I wonder if it wasn't just a male or it could have been a female too rolling around. It's always quite funny when the hippos do roll about and make a lot of noise. Isn't that cool though? Lots of sort of birds flying around at the moment too. Just listening to see if I can hear any different calls. I'm looking for those cutthroat finch because they are so beautiful. And they like it around here. I'm just scanning as you're staring at the hippos. I haven't seen any just yet though. But you can hear lots of little tweets when the Egyptian geese aren't making a huge racket. You can actually hear it. That, now that very whistle-like call, that's not from a kingfisher or from the Egyptian goose. That's the beautiful call of the water thickney, the bird that we had a look at just a moment ago. There's quite a few of them. I don't know what, obviously they've ruffled their feathers slightly. Unusual to hear them calling. Oh wow, look at this. Sorry, Seb, I don't know what's going on here. There's a greeting display of some sort with these water thickney. Sorry, I just noticed that now. It was very interesting. You don't really get to spend time with these birds. Let's see if they're going to do it again. Like I said, they're not normally so active during the day. But anything is possible. But they were sort of calling. And then two approached each other and they opened up their feathers. They fanned their tails out and opened their wings. It didn't seem to be very threatening though. Because then they sort of came quite close together. And sort of their beaks clattered together. So that would mean that's not very aggressive. They're quite social birds though. They're gregarious. We do see them in large groups. I'm sure they're monogamous though. Actually, let me check up on about that while you have a look at them. Let's quickly go to thick knees. When you go to tea, I actually don't know what their breeding cycle and all that. Let's go, yeah. Water thick knee. Oh, that was quick and easy. Mm, yeah, mono they are monogamous. Okay, well, that's quite cool. So that's obviously a pair over there. So maybe it was a pair that I saw. Maybe they have a nest around there. Most of these birds that live near the water's edge, and particularly the ones that live on the ground, they will make sort of shallow scrapes, just like the plovers do, just like the blacksmith lapwings do. So it will be a very sort of basic nest. Obviously, you don't want to draw too much attention to your nest. If it is on the ground, you don't want it to be a beacon, like what a hummer corp sort of makes. You know, they use them for territorial purposes too. It's a complete opposite. They want to try and keep their nest as hidden from all sorts of different animals or potentially the predators, the ones that would be feeding on their eggs or their young chicks. But they're quite beautiful birds. Now, CNAC, you're wondering how many different types... Oh, there's a heron. Did you see it? Just on this fallen shrub. Go a little bit to the left. It's just in there and on that shrub that's fallen in the water, that tree. And CNAC, you're sorry, you're wondering how many... Of course, uh, thick knees do we get? Well, the most common ones we see. Oi, there goes a greenback heron. Where are you going to land? On an even better perch. Fantastic. Uh, we, we see the spotted thick knee and the water thick, water thick knees are the two most common. Uh, I don't think I've actually ever seen any other thick
classic knees before. I think that could be the only ones. In fact, they are the only ones that we see in, in southern Africa. Now, that's a very cool bird. I, I saw Dylan, Brent's brother, earlier. And I said, he said, what are you, what you looking for? And I said, I'm going to look for a, a greenback heron today and watch it fish. And here we go. So we asked for the giraffe, we asked for the elephants, and now we have got our heron too. I love these birds. They're really fun to watch. I think you've got to have a lot of patience with them, though, because you can sit for ages and then really not do anything. I love this perch and it sits here every now and then we see it and it's, it's taken obviously refuge under that tree that the hippos pulled over but it likes this spot too and it's quite close to the water so it, it's not using the technique of actually wading through the water notice with the green back herons they prefer to sort of sit on a perch and and hunt like this and they're able to stretch their necks out see it got something and stab the water Now, Sherry, a question about herons, and, and, and not the one that we're looking at, but about a grey heron. It's about, are the grey herons related to the great blue heron in, in America? Um, I don't know. You might find they're being the same genus, but whether they're in the same family or not, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't actually ever, I, well, I have, I've heard of the great blue herons. I've actually seen a great blue heron. I talk absolutely nonsense. So I one in the distance. But um, I haven't done much research about them, so I'm unsure. But if anybody does know, you're welcome to let us know. Please let Sherry know. Hashtag Safari Live. Let me know too. It'll be interesting to learn or, or tag me in it. And I can have a little read about it later. You're catching little insects. I can't actually really see what it's going for, but it's, it's not particularly big. It's not every day that you can be successful and catch a large fish sometimes you have to just opt for the smaller things you know catch a hundred smaller things than one larger thing maybe you're going to use a bit more energy but as long as you get food in your belly in the end of the day that is the most important thing look at it i love that stance though legs sort of splayed wide open and i think that's a good tactic to have holding on nice and tight so that you don't lose your balance obviously if you had your feet right next to each other you would have very limited movement i suppose it's exactly how a, a, a sportsman a hockey player for example you never stand with your feet together and i don't think rugby players do the same or soccer players you're always ready to run into a gap or well you know to run after a ball of some sort what are you catching what do you think it is Seb? little insects on the surface of the water so obviously going for the same sorts of things that the blacksmith lapwing and the three-banded plover would be going for just these little insects whatever they are on the water some of them may even be little grasshoppers but of course if a little fish swims by and i think that's what this heron is hoping uh, it swims by and tries to go for one of those insects on the surface of the water it's going to go for the fish instead and you, with these smaller species of herons, they, they're quite shy. Although I think this one has seen enough vehicles and also heard a lot of noise around the lodges, which is, which is quite cool. So it's actually become quite relaxed. But it's not uncommon for these smaller species of herons to actually sort of go fishing. And, and not, I'm not, I mean not just by sitting on a stick like this and using the, the waiting technique, but by actually, there's a, a fantastic video where there's a, a heron putting bread out, trying to lure the fish in. And I think that's so funny and so fantastic, uh, able to do something like that. But I think it would be very rewarding, of course, if this one were to catch a fish for us. We didn't see the, the giant kingfisher catch anything. I think we're being patient enough, so it would, of course, be nice if that bird would make a lucky strike. See, now I don't want to go anywhere because I have a feeling it's, uh, you know, it's hit the surface of the water a few times and not come up with any too much, well, not too much. Well, maybe if we wait, we'll catch something. Now, Annabella, you're wondering how often do green-backed herons lay eggs? Should we have a look? Because I'm not sure on that one, so I don't want to tell you stories. Let's go breeding. Let's see how how often oh, okay so they're solitary nesters firstly the monogamous mm, female builds the nest this is what I'm just reading because I'm not 100% sure about all the, obviously the breeding habits of the 850 odd bird species that we get here 
in southern Africa. Mm, let's go, how often? I'm, probably, I'm sure it's going to be once a year that they will lay eggs. Let's see what time of the year. They've definitely got that. It's normally now, in fact. September, October, November, actually right through till, till June, but the peak seems to be sort of around November, December time, and they build their nests fairly quickly, so they won't need too much time. Let's see. Yeah, the incubation period is very, uh, very similar to most of the birds, which is between 21 and 27 days. That's actually quite typical for a lot of the birds out here. So, Sherry and I, I'm quite confident to say that it doesn't really say if they lay eggs every year, but with such a short period, I'd say at least once a year. And then, it's quite cool. I'd like to find a greenback heron nest. Perhaps we'll have to start going round and round the dam, searching very carefully. But I also would like to find a water thickening nest, because that's a nest I haven't found. Now, Laurie, you're wondering if herons nest on the ground or in trees? Well, the grey heron and the black-headed heron, they make these beautiful platform nests. And um, so, so they nest typically up in trees. There's another one. There's another greenback heron. You see, that's why it's focused as drawn. And you hear that that was from the other heron. It's actually sitting in the sun. On the, it's coming to the edge. On the edge of the island. Sorry, Sherry, I'll get to your question now. Bless you. If you go, yeah, yeah there we go. That branch over here, it's sitting just up a little bit higher. Uh, no, up, straight up. On there's a, you can see it actually fluttering in the light. If you zoom in, there we go. So there's another one. This must be a pair then. The two of them. Um, that's very cool. Just in the sunlight there. I wonder if it's going to go and join its partner on... Maybe, actually, maybe we're going to find a nest, Sherry. Here we go. Because they do. The, the, the greenback herons apparently also make their nests in trees. They won't be obviously as massive as that of the, the grain her uh, the grain heron. The grey and the black-headed heron. They're much larger. Just watching it, no, just having a preen. But again, they'd all make just a smaller version of a platform nest. So I'm just thinking, that's so why I wanted to have a look here because I thought maybe they're going to lead us to a nest. We have seen a lot of the other birds starting to prepare to lay eggs. We've seen a lot of courtship displays. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's a few when the conditions are good and the weather is warm to lay your, lay your eggs a little bit earlier. Let's see where you're going to go. You're going to dive down into the thicket there. That would be a good spot. Lots of sort of horizontal branches, and that's what you need when you want to make a platform nest. I don't think we've seen, or I have not seen, two of the, the greenback herons together. So that's nice to know. Uh, they do have a, have a mate. And they're around here. And they've moved to the island now. They used to live in the most eastern corner of the dam. And we used to see them there often. And now they've changed spots. Perhaps the fishing down that end got a bit bad. Or they're just sustain sustainable fishermen. And they don't want to exhaust all their resources in one go. And they've moved on and they'll come back there in a few weeks' time. Well, I'd like to think that. So we'll go with that then. And now the wind again has changed direction. You can see it's ruffling this bird's feathers now still hasn't caught anything big even though we we're looking at that other one up in the tree i was having a closer look down below but no no luck and there's lots of oh, oh we've got our, our friend again the blacksmith lapwing chasing all the water thick knees around what is wrong with you are so aggressive just leave them you know what that reminds me of the way that they sort of drop their head down and arch their back is a sort of a, 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 I don't know what you would call them, but a not a very nice person in an alley. You know, putting, throwing his hood over its head and walking down as if it were going to rob you. They're very intimidating. Now, Kerry, you're wondering if uh, the herons are a protected species? 
in South Africa like they are in America. Uh, yes, there are some of the herons. I'm not sure if it's all of the herons, but I know the grey heron, if I'm not mistaken, and the, the black-headed heron, well, they were protected down in the Eastern Cape. Uh, I'm not sure if it's for all the areas. Haven't actually done too much research about that. But a lot of the bird species out here, even in H Hardy Dot Ibis is actually a protected species. And, and you would think, my goodness, they're in abundance. And they are labelled as one of the most annoying birds in, in South Africa. Um, but they're indeed protected. If you shoot one of them, you get a huge fine. Uh, so, so I'm sure that the herons would be, especially we have so many wetland areas around in South Africa and, and we know that herons love sort of frequent, frequenting those spots. Um, so I would imagine so. They unfortunately would, I think, be under threat from um, sort of the po us as humans, our population, wanting just to destroy everything. But a very nice bird. And well, speaking of the hardy ibis, we've actually got one here, so we might, might as well show you. He's just feeding in front of the car. I'll still watch that here and see if it catches something delicious for us. But there's just one lonely hardy da. Where's your friends? That also, again, just like the water thickness, normally you'll see them in large flocks, and they'll be around together. But not really bothered, and I don't know if this hardy da would stand for that blacksmith lapwing chasing it around. But they are brave, bold birds, those lapwings, so I think they would chase something much larger than it. That's a good spot to probe. You can see it's sort of hanging around a sort of stump of some sort, and it looks like it's fairly rotten. So I think probing around there, I think you'll get a lot of, especially boring beetles, maybe some termites and ants uh, living around, and maybe some grubs living in the ground around that bit of wood there. So it's a good spot circulating all the way around making sure there you go even going in down the middle now no couldn't stick its beak through the wood so it's moving away now very interesting to watch these birds so we sit at Vuyatela Dam and we see the hardy dars there wading through the water sort of utilizing the area that the African sacred ibis is with, the black and white hardy dars essentially and we don't see them wading here at Chitwa I haven't seen that behavior here Quite amazing how it's it's area specific. I know you see it on uh, the Pete's Pond uh, camera as well, the dam cam in Botswana. That happens there too. You see those hardy dars. Where's our heron gone? It's moved off now. And there's the hippos again. They're just relaxing a little bit. Not really getting up to too much just yet. I think it's still a little bit early for them to be splashing about. Now, I've lost our friend the crocodile. I don't know where it swam to. I thought it was going to maybe come up to the island. But I'm scanning and I can't see it anymore. Perhaps it's gone to the other side of the dam. It was very peaceful here this afternoon. Very relaxing. Oh, we've got... Oh, my goodness. Hang on, let me turn around. We've got virtual starlings having a huge argument. No, don't fly. Come, please carry on fighting. There they go. Look here. See those starlings? I don't know if you can see. They're, they're all landing, but not the one that's landed up top in the uh, tree. The two on the lower branch, they're just sitting still now. There they fly. There one goes. Let's see if they land on the ground again because they were having a proper box. And, I mean, it sounds silly to say birds boxing, but it's like what they're doing. Let me turn the vehicle just a little bit more. Let's see if they're going to do it again. But they were jumping up and down on the ground and they were trying to claw each other. They were pecking at each other. But it's now seemed to have settled down. So maybe it was just a. I don't know. Maybe we're going to see it again. Let's see. We have to be a bit patient. That was very interesting. To me, the most amazing bird fight I've ever seen was between two fork tailed drongos. My goodness. They were having a go at one another and not letting up either. It went on for about 10 minutes. So a serious territorial dispute. And let's not forget that day we saw the blacksmith lapwing pull a feather out of a turtle dove as it was trying to fly away. No, of course, Murphy's Law, as soon as we put the camera on them, they stop fighting and they, and they behave. That's so funny. Right. We've been doing lots and lots and lots of talking. Tristan's been out of the car. Let's go across to him and see if he's found anything.
Well, the mystery continues because it just doesn't get any easier. We've now found tracks for a female which, judging by the size, would to me look like Shongile. Now these tracks are on top of my vehicle tracks from the morning. Sorry, Sensor. Um, and the reason why I know that is because I know that our tire track is a certain tread. So if we have a look here, you can actually see, Sensor, if you should go out, you'll see my tire track from this afternoon that came across. So it's got this little wavy pattern, and then you can see the same wavy pattern that runs in the circle that I have here. And in the middle of that is a little female leopard footprint. So you can see the back paws here, three lobes there, and the toes that come out. So it means that this female walked after I drove here right at the end of drive. She walked in this area. The male track that we had earlier cut to my south. So if it wasn't confusing enough that we had the male tracks here, we now have a female walking around. And from where we are now, it kind of continues on the road for about five meters, and then from there it just vanishes. I have no idea where it goes from there. It seems to just kind of drift off the road but I can't find exactly where it goes at all which is not ideal so I don't know where these leopards are at the moment I would imagine they're somewhere close by maybe that's why the young male went back into this drainage maybe the female is somewhere inside here but I don't know I've walked around I've checked I can't see any more signs the problem is there's also a number of animals inside here that are not friendly to walk around so I'm trying to just work out somehow to have a look Katie wondering if Hosanna and Shongile could stay around each other when they're grown Katie the answer to that is probably no um, just from a point of view that you know Shongile is going to want to mate and, and ting, uh, Hosanna is going to want to be territorial which means that he has to spend his time marking territory otherwise he's going to lose out to other males it's going to be difficult for him to keep a territory if he's always with one female and following her around and that's just completely against leopard behavior they don't form groupings like that male leopards will will go and they'll try and establish as big an area as possible so as to mate with as many females as possible because remember they rely on instinct both female and male they the instinct is to survive which is to live and well to feed to drink and to reproduce and so reproduction means that they've got to expand out and they've got to find territories and and so you'll find that they'll split apart there's also going to be bigger other males that are certainly going to take interest in Shongile at some stage um, in the near future as soon as she comes into her first Easter cycle you're going to find the big males are going to get her attention and then Hosanna has got no chance against these bigger guys like Tingana we saw last night that Hosanna once he sees a leopard and he's not sure he backs off slightly and he and he tries to kind of get out of there and that will be a very good survival tactic if he comes across the bigger guys like Quarantine, his older brother, or Tingana, or even Mvula. He's not going to be able to sort of fight with them just yet. He's still on the small side. He needs to grow up a little bit more and get a little bulkier and a bit, a bit more chunky before he's able to actually start really going after um, females to mate with. So I don't think Hassan and Shongila are going to be around together all the time. And also, as we know, over the last four or five months, we've really not seen them together much at all. We've only seen them yesterday, and prior to that was a long, long time ago. So they don't spend much time together anymore, and, and that's just a result of all the other leopards that are around that are putting pressure on them. The thing is, is that these tracks here, there's, it can only be either them or Tandi and Tamba, it's in an area where either one could walk. Tundi and Tamba do walk in that area as well, so difficult to say who it is and which one it is. I would imagine that their general direction um, is south, so checking this northern side is a real, real kind of stab in the dark. I, I highly doubt they would have come this direction, but you never know. It's worth just having a little look and having a try and seeing. Failing any sort of luck on this side, I, I really, I don't know. I think I might just go and try and find somewhere where I can sit, much like what Taylor's doing at Chitra Dam, find a dam where I can sit and just do some birding and listen out that's close by in, in, in the close proximity to where we are, that if there is any alarm calls that I can then hear it and come. It's very difficult to try and find leopards when you're only on foot for five, ten minutes at a time. Leopard tracking sometimes takes a long period and it's something you've got to really focus on and concentrate on and it is a difficult thing to do every sort of five minutes jumping off getting back on jumping off back on so hopefully we'll get some sort of help from one of the other animals out here like an impala the squirrels of course are not reliable at all so we need monkeys or impalas or kudu or nyala to help us out and while we sort of do that in fact i've actually spotted a giraffe can you see the giraffe senzo 
If you can see the giraffe, I'll be impressed. Can you see it? Maybe Senzo can see it. it no, you out, oh, Senzo, right on the other side. <laughs> Way up, 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 up. Somewhere there, I would imagine. Have you got it in your viewfinder? Uh, let's see. It's somewhere in that general vicinity where Senzo is pointing. On the other side of the hill. There it is. You can see it just walking through there. So there goes our giraffe. It is very far away. And by the time we get anywhere near it, I'm pretty sure it's going to be gone. It looks like it's walking somewhere between Gauri Cutline and Mvubu, that area. So unfortunately disappearing but that's what we're going to try and do is just try and find something that we can sit with and listen out and hopefully something will give themselves away and while we do that let's go back to Brent Leo Smith all the way in the Maasai Mara and see what he's up to and how it's going with the migration well we're cruising through the middle of the migration and uh not making as many excuses about leopard tracking or lion tracking as Tristan is at the moment. Uh, Tristan, my advice is just take bigger steps. You cover more ground in those five to ten minutes. But uh, this is one of my uh, sort of go-to areas if we get out in the afternoon, uh, especially when we're surrounded by wildebeest. Now, there's a little section up here called Mlimambili, the two hills. They're two tiny little hills. And... Um, Lion, leopard, cheetah are often around these two hills, so I think we're going to get lucky around them. Now, as I said, the migration is quite spread out at the moment. We've been driving through it for quite a while since we left the river. Lauren wants to know, why do the wildebeest run in circles when cha being chased by predators? Lauren, well, in normal circumstance what they do is they'll run around and look uh, to see where the predator is, make sure they can sort of keep safe distance. But the problem is when there's so many of them, they sort of push the front runners back onto the predators. Uh, and I'm afraid to say, probably because wildebeest are just quite stupid is the, is the true answer. And uh, these seem to be particularly stupid, these uh, white-bearded variety. And uh, they sort of rely on the sheer mass of numbers uh, for survival. There's only so many lions, I mean, I mean, only so many wildebeest a lion can catch before it is too tired to catch any more. Now, see, this is quite interesting now. We've sort of just come out, like we've come out of a sea of wildebeest, and now we're in a sea of grass, and that there's like a big loop around these two hills of no wildebeest and no zebra, which could be a very good sign for predators. Gianni would like to know, do the, uh, predators ever get impaled by the gnu horns? I'd say they might get a few wounds from them, but a uh, gnu horn is not really sufficient to impale something like a lion. Uh, maybe a cheetah, but I'd say, again, very, very, very rare. They might ca pick up a small wound, but uh, I doubt they will be run through, so to speak. Okay, here we go. Where are you, kitty cats? I've got a feeling you're sitting under the crotons thickets on top of the hill. Hi, Patrick. Patrick's wondering why we don't see leopards. We do, Patrick. Um, and actually, I saw leopard right around here that uh, killed the warthog, took it out from under the ground. We did a Facebook Live on that. Uh, but at the moment, while the migration's here, Patrick, our focus is on the lions and cheetah and not so much on the leopards. Um, but if we, we do see them, I think I've seen well over 20 leopards um, in our nocturnal soirees and during the day. And uh, But... Uh, we just really haven't had the opportunity where the, the leopards have fallen within um, our storyline at the moment, which is trying to keep along with the migration. And of course, the leopards do utilize the migration, like all the other predators, but not to the same extent as our hyenas, cheetahs, and lions. Okay. So we got some wildies here. We got some wildies beyond. So, I think. 
there's going to be a kitty cat on this hill, just judging from where the wildebeest are. Let's stop and have a quick look. And we've got two little hills to check. Let's check this one first. We've got a... We do have a predator, so I was right. Uh, the first one of the afternoon, a black-backed jackal. Uh, black back the jackal. Now, quite often, watching their behaviour can give you a good sign if there's a lion about, or at least a carcass. Hmm. Nothing I can see on this side of the hill, so let's follow the jackal round the other side. Just having a quick look, see if there are any footprints here. Now, this is a perfect spot for a predator. Get up a little bit high, see the migration all around. Hello, cat in Tampa. Cat's wondering, do we have monkeys in the Mara? Indeed we do. We have two species. We have Sykes monkey, uh, actually three species, um, Sykes monkey and uh, vervet monkeys and uh, black and white colobus monkeys. And they do tend to live up on the forest on the escarpment or along the river. Lion, Tristan, that's how you do it. So, again, Tristan, sometimes you need to think like an animal rather than just following the tracks. Be the leopard, Tristan, be the leopard. So, of course, in areas like this, it is, it is quite interesting. Oh, there's quite a few lions. I only saw the one lioness up top. Okay, we got, let's see. We've got one lioness right up top. That's the one I spotted first. Now, this is quite interesting. Um, yes, here we go. There's some up there. There's a little bit to the left. There we go. There's the first girl. Now, let me get a bit closer just now to see how fat they are. Oh, there's a male as well, and he's very well camouflaged. So, there we go. Right in front of me, actually. There we go. So, there's four lionesses that I can see. And... Uh, you can see they spread out on the hill, and it's a perfect spot because the wildebeest are not far from them at all. And uh, we've got a male who is very well camouflaged, um, off to the left slightly from the girls. So directly in front of me, there's a termite a little bit to the right a bit more. There we go. It looks like a male, just looks a bit bigger. Well, let's get a little bit closer. Um, but before we do that, you can see they're in a perfect spot here. The wildebeest are literally around them. So if you look to my right, um, you can see there's wildebeest very close by. Spread out over the plains that they've shortened. But let's get a little bit closer and see if we can figure out which pride of lions this is. So there we go, we're going to move a bit closer to the lions. See if we can figure out which pride it is. Uh, Lady Starfire says, is it harder to track in the Mara? Um, it's much harder. The roads are much harder, and especially after it rains a little bit. It, the, it really gets a, a really, really, really compacted. But that's not, it's over. There is, that's not a male. I, did see, I thought I saw a man. There is a male there, but there's more lionesses than I thought. So there's one, two, three, four, five, possibly six lionesses. This could be one of two prides, and two prides. I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm, might be my favourite. Now, the easiest way to tell is going to be by looking at some of the females to see if they're lactating, and also by looking at the male to see which male it is. No, wait, hang on, hang on. We've got lions for days here. And I think this then that probably makes me think it could be the salt lick pride. Um, I have seen some of them up here, so let's count. We got, there we go, the first girl we spotted, one. 
Just want to make sure we don't miss any. Then there's up at the back. There we go. You see our bottom there? Two. Oh, wait, there's another one there. Yeah, there's two up there. One. So that's two. And then three. Four. Five. Six. And a male. It could also be Egyptian goose pride. I mean, we're right on the, the periphery of both their, their territories. I'm gonna go, let's go move around a little bit, see if we can get a view of the male. Oh, this is a young boy. This is a young boy. This is definitely Egyptian goose. He's given away which pride this is. Now, these prides split and get back together so often. Uh, it can sometimes make it quite tricky. But while we move around to see uh, if we can find out which big male it is, uh, let's go to Taylor, who's trying to take off on Chitwa. Well, it's very quiet again now. I think we've uh, seen all the animals that we can see or that we wanted to see. Uh, we haven't really seen too much else. We're just on Chitwa airstrip, just taking a little sunset cruise. I don't know where we'll go. I might bumble up and down one or two of the roads, but unfortunately that'll have to be the end of Chitwa Dam for us as they're setting up a sundowner stop at 5.30. Although they started prepping it now, and we need to be out of that area. So it's a nice surprise for the guests. So I think, we, like I said, we'll bumble up and down one or two of these roads and then probably start making our way back towards Juma. I'm trying to think, no one's really said anything about the Nguhumas, so I wonder if the Nguhumas are not in before. So there's lots of leopard tracks here as well and lion tracks, but I think the leopard tracks are quite, didn't look particularly fresh and we know that the sticks were here too. So very old windblown lion tracks around here. Let's go down the next road. And we'll have a quick little squiz. You never know really what's going to step out in the road in front of you. You never know, maybe a pack of wild dogs enters the uh, show. That would be nice. I'd be very excited to see some wild dogs. Now, so Rumi about the two sticks from the two sticks cubs from the sticks pride mm, I don't think so uh, they were obviously confirmed they were found and then I saw the four youngsters uh, so I'm sure they would have been fetched by the adults no one no one has really said anything I know I, I think those sticks are on a net somewhere but unfortunately we don't have the greatest radio comms so I think the best thing is just to keep out on social media and if anybody pop posts a picture of the sticks from that sighting or any videos you might be able to to count but I haven't heard anything but I'm sure those adults would have known where those youngsters were left and uh, they would have gone back to fetch them eventually uh, nothing particularly fresh around here on Chitwa driveway and we'll have a little look some elephant tracks but going in the opposite direction going back down that way and we didn't see any elephants from that side so they must be off into the thicket please stay in my hair let's tuck the uh, my mic cable back under my cap let's see if there's any birdies of course we're always on the lookout for birds Oh, that makes sense. It's about falling out the car. Let me put that back. Nope, no one around here. No horn bills to see just yet. Odd turtle dove flying around. Not even an impala just yet. It's pretty too. It's nice golden light. Be nice if we had an animal to have a look at. But let's go across to Tristan, who's on Juma searching for leopards. Well, Taylor, I'm, searching for leopards is probably an overstatement. I think we've we're looking, but we are having very little success today, which is the way it goes, I suppose. I think I'm going to just give it a break for a while. And sometimes when you get a little bit kind of frustrated by it and you start to get a little bit more desperate you start to actually send out the wrong vibes so I think time to just let it go enjoy the beautiful sunlight that we've got in the late afternoon 
go and check the Milawati, go and check some of the water holes as it gets a little bit later, and then just get a spotlight out and do another loop around here on the way home, and maybe we get lucky. It's At this stage, we've kind of given most of the day to it, and there's just trucks everywhere. It's difficult to decode who's who, where's where, and it's also in the most unfriendly parts of the property so all these drainage lines and places where it is very difficult to access that's the other side of it is even if we had to find leopards in half these places whether or not we could get a vehicle there would be anyone's guess so i think let's just give it a, a break for a little bit and get some positive vibes back and hopefully get it to see some other things given that we've concentrated so much on tracking the last two drives it's also been quite quiet though. I've driven around and I haven't really seen too much. I haven't seen any kudu or nyala or bushbuck or anything like that. It's just been that impala herd that I had earlier. I haven't seen any signs of other animals. So now I believe Brent Leo Smith is really whipping out the big guns today and he's solidly putting in a big performance and he's found himself a scrub here. Yes, well, see, they're much harder to track and find than leopards, Tristan, scrub hares. But I just noticed it in the grass while we were sitting next to the lions. The lions have not even noticed it yet. And um, we've got two heads up. Unfortunately, the male is very, very flat in some very thick bush. We actually found a, a, a seventh female. So there's seven females. Oh, sorry, I lie. Seven non-adult males. And we've got one young male, six females so far. And they're all looking very well fed. That's possibly why that little jackal was around, scavenging off whatever leftovers they might have had for breakfast. Hello, lovely Laurie. I hope you're having a lovely evening. Um, Laurie would like to know. Do lion prides live together in the Mara? Well, the same as lion prides throughout Africa. Um, there will be the natal female pride that will generally stay together and they will defend their territory from other females. Um, and the males' coalitions often have multiple groups of females that they lord over and uh, and up to three or four prides in some cases, depending on the side of the co size of the coalition. Oh, we've got standing up. Well, he looks like he didn't get as much as everyone else. A young male like this, for example, probably at around two and a half, three years old, so it's still a while to go yet, um, he would be pushed out of the area by the adult males. Now, if his, the adult dominant males got killed or got pushed out earlier, he would have to disappear at a much younger age. Uh, hello, Aaron in New Zealand. Aaron's wondering if there have been any recent updates on Scarface and the other uh, musketeer. Well, see, now it's so confusing. We've got musketeer lions and musketeer cheetah. Well, the musketeer lions, Scarface, uh, Hunter, Morani, and... Oh, dear. Tsikyo. Yeah, thank you, Kirsten. Um, uh, yeah, they have been seen a few times on the other side of the river. And they haven't been in the triangle side for a bit. But that doesn't mean they won't be back. So, yes, they'll be around, I'm sure. They all seem to be doing quite well at the moment. So, uh, last update, I heard all is well in, in Musketeer territory. Well, controlling those crossing points, of course, there's lots of food around them at the moment. Oh, yeah, good groom. She seems to have done far better on the food front than that young male. Uh, Orchid Wave is wondering about our little uh, scrub hair friend. Well, um, Manu, what's it in uh, Swahili again? Sungura. There we go, other little Sungura, we're going to try to find it again and see how well camouflage. Those lions have probably nearly stepped on him about five times and they still haven't managed to um, spot him yet. Oh, 
Um, there he is. Um, and uh, I think he'd be a bit, actually a bit quick for the Lions. Um, well, you never know. Lions are capable of great bursts of speed. But I think he probably would be a little bit quick for them. Oh, flap it, Lark. Uh, don't fly too high. Come down. Come down. Oh, that'll be a good one for the bird list. But, oh dear, he's flown over the roof. But uh, you can hear, you can just hear this flapping wings of the flap it, Lark. Where's he gone? He's flown over our heads, I'm afraid. Oh dear. Okay, well, we're going to sit here, see if these lions decide to go try and snack on some bildebeest just now. Um, while we do that, let's see where Taylor's bumbling about. Hello again, everybody. We are still just driving. Doesn't seem to be many animals out and about today. Everyone's gone home. Maybe the herd of elephants will come back though, because they marched on into Torchwood. They disappeared and crossed the road before I could even get onto Gowrie Main. They were running. They might come this way. I don't know what their sort of general thinking was, why they didn't really drink at the dam. It was very, very sort of brief. Some of them didn't even have wet trunks, they didn't even get a chance to have a drink, so they might have to stop at another dam a little bit later. We're on Cheetah Cut Line now. Um, I haven't decided what I'm going to do, if I'm going to go down maybe Mumba Road, or if I'm going to go on Leadwood, or if I'm going to go up towards Buffalo's Dam. Sep, what do you want to do? You can go and have a look at Buffalo's Hook. Okay, there you go. Seb hasn't been down that way for a while, so we shall head that side. There's all some, some footprints on the ground, but if it's a leopard track, I'm not looking at it. I'm going to close my eyes. I think it was a hyena, actually, that was running on the road here. So it actually seems fairly quiet, although I'm actually on the wrong radio channel, it's probably why <laughs> that would explain the quietness, let's turn that up. So I haven't really heard what's going on in the north. Uh, they've just found some lions by the sounds of it in the nets, I think the sticks pride as I was saying to you earlier. I haven't really heard any updates from the west. It's been a fairly quiet 24 hours, well not even, no not quite 24 hours, starting from this morning. Clouds, they're starting to go away now. Hopefully that's the end of the weather. Uh, hopefully that wind disappears because there's a serious nip in the air. We don't like that. We want the warm weather. We like our warm winters. I'm in shorts though, so I suppose I can't really complain. It's not it's not that that cold, but it's not particularly nice either. So who knows? I wonder what the temperature's gonna be tomorrow. Maybe we'll have a little squiz at that at some point. Okay, we're going to go all the way up here. Ah, there we go. Now, Caitlin, who is only 10 years old, you're wondering if the elephants are the most intelligent animals in the bush. I think there's lots of contenders, um, but I, elephants are definitely up there. Hyenas, Caitlin, are another one that are very intelligent too. And even dwarf mongoose, honey badgers, they're all very, very clever. So it's hard to sort of say, I mean, how do you how do you test that? Do you give them a Rubik's Cube? Do they have to try and solve it? Whoever does it fastest is the most intelligent. Do you give them a test of some sort? I don't know. It's difficult to try and test the animal's intelligence out here. Um, I suppose uh, hyenas are very good. They're problem solvers. We see it constantly. <coughs> oh, there's an elephant. If you've ever worked in the bush before and they're coming towards us, that's great. Then you'll know how good hyenas are at problem solving, especially when it comes to <laughs> trying to figure out how to break into your camp to steal everything. They're masterminds. I think this is the same herd of elephants, in fact. It looks quite large. I've just seen lots of grey heads in the distance coming this way. Well, that'll be nice if it is. It could be, again be a different herd, but just because I can hear branches breaking 
from even a, quite a distance away from me. I suspect that it's that big herd. And we've got that lovely golden light. Now, obviously, there's lots of silver cluster leaves growing in and amongst here. They're feeding in this grove at the moment, so it's not the clearest view, but they are coming towards us. So maybe in the next 10 minutes or so, we'll be surrounded by elephants. I just hope and, and wish that they'll be calm and actually spend some time around here. But they're not on our traverse just yet. They're on Torchwood. I'm glad we came up this way. There you go, stretching up. What are you trying to reach, little one? Those silver cluster leaves are not very nice. I don't know if you'd want to eat them. Are you going for the bark? You might struggle, I think. Look at that, trying to pull the little bits of bark. Hasn't really worked out the technique of stripping long lengths of bark just yet. It'll get there. Mom obviously did that earlier and is now trying to make use of that uh, area that's already sort of been broken off a little bit easier. Now, there's lots of elephants here. I think it's the same herd. Mm, that's good that they don't seem to be racing on anymore. Obviously, they got a fright at Chitwa Dam because they were on the move. I mean, the amount of dust they were kicking up, they, they weren't quite running, they were brisk walking. Whenever I see elephants also walking like that, they remind me of um, you know, mom's club, running club. Well, not really running club, but with the sweatbands on, knee-high socks, marching down the streets. Oh, that's exciting. Right, we're going to sit with these elephants for as long as possible. I'm going to send you across to Tristan, who has got, sounds like Janet Jackson. Well, we did have Janet Jackson. She's now disappeared again, or he, I'm not sure which one, which is the theme of this afternoon. So it seems as though nothing wants to stick around for us to actually see it. I'm just going to try roll back to the lower hole and just see if she's, or he, like I say, is not there. It went from the lower hole upwards, but there's a series of sort of holes going higher. So I think our Janet friend has just gone into an area where it can't be seen. So... That's about the sum total of our afternoon. That sums it up right there, that we did have a view of her inside, but now gone. It was literally, as Taylor said, you're coming across, that it disappeared. So, yeah, I'm just going to leave it there and carry on and not dwell on this right now because otherwise I'm going to be get upset. Um, but what we do have is at least some life, sign of life, which is behind me, which is... A set of squirrels that is just feeding away so they're not too concerned about Janet Jackson they fairly relaxed at this stage so there we go they're in that tree they're, uh, they're chasing each other around now on the branch so when all else fails squirrels will be there to help you can see they're busy devouring a marula nut which they would have stored from last season right now it sounds like Brent has got lines so let's go across to him <laughs> Here we go, another one of the lions. Not as full as some of them. And I think she might have heard some wildebeest approaching in the lee of the hill. Now the wildebeest behind us are on very short grass, so not a good spot to hunt. But there is a bit of longer grass off to the left, and you can see the sheer mass of wildebeest in the distance. But she's focusing on something a lot closer by. Oh, she's the only one up. She's a youngster, though. But there could very easily be some wildebeest heading straight towards them. As I say, we are surrounded by thousands upon thousands. Okay, let's try and move to see what she's looking at. I can't see over the hill. Ah, I see what she sees. Between these two trees there, those ones there, Manu. That's what she spotted. Some zebra, but uh, quite young. I think she might be a bit outgunned unless she gets some help from on, on top from some of the bigger females. And I think she's been spotted. Was that a snort directed at a lion, a zebra? Ah, there's wildebeest as well. Now they're easier fare than zebra. I don't know what she needs to happen is for some of these other lions to get up. Oh, one is up. 
and go across from behind the top of the hill like that so they need to come here she comes there we go but I don't think she sees what's going on just yet oh a flapped lark's back Quickly for the bird, is he you can get him or is he too too high? Uh, no. Oh there he goes down. And he's landed. Ah. But we've got a lioness on the move. Bird is you're gonna have to wait for your flap at lark Mara tick. Here we go. Also quite young. Probably around two, two and a half years old. My world, your music wants to know, does a zebra have a stronger kick than a wildebeest, I think I heard? Yes, most definitely. They are a lot more dangerous to take down than a wildebeest. Oh, than a giraffe. No, definitely not. Uh, a giraffe's wildebeest. There we go. Now you're using your noggin. Now let's hope the other lionesses pick up on her body language. And they can set themselves a successful ambush in this beautiful golden late afternoon light. Okay, we need to reposition because if we're going to miss what's happening, so I need to get around the other side. Of the road. <laughs> uh, so this is quite funny. So we have... Uh, David, who's our chef, sitting um, up at our camp, and David wants to know, is this really live? Yes, David. Hi, David. What's for dinner, by the way, David? I'm quite hungry already. Uh, David's waving back. Okay, David. What's for dinner? Chicken. Yum, yum. Chicken tarragon. Sounds delicious. I can't wait. But now let's see if we can see the lions find their dinner before Manu and I find ours. Oh, I don't like rocks. Bouncy, bouncy rocks. So normally I just drive there, but I'm, I don't want to drive too close to the lioness. She's over there, so I'm going to get round into a good spot. So while I do that, uh, let's go to Taylor and a great grey pachyderm. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I'm reversing as you can see. I'm trying to get some elephants for you. I'll be with you in 15 seconds. 10. Oh, no, I'll just stop counting. Hi elephants! We saw, we saw Needle our elephant, the elephant with the long, very pointy tusk, so she's made it back to the herd. Hello, girl. Do you mind if we come and say hello? Would you have a problem with that? No, you seem very relaxed. Yes, you're all nice and calm now. I'm sorry that you were so distraught a little bit earlier. Isn't that so sweet? You can't go up that way. Careful, you're too big to fit through Mom's legs. This little boy, Hashem, he's very sweet. No, I'm not convinced that it's one family herd because everybody's very sort of split up here. It's actually mom, all the, the adult females and their offspring hanging around together. So there, there must be a, a couple of different family groups. So you're going to have a suckle for us. It'll be very nice if you suckle in the golden light. The, this calf's not a particularly young calf. It's actually also quite tall. I didn't really see any tusks protruding, but maybe I missed that. It's probably just over a year old. Maybe a year and a half. Now, Sinak, you're wondering 
if or how uh, do mother elephants communicate with their calves? Do they use infrasound? Most certainly. It obviously takes those little ones a little bit of time, I'm sure, to learn um, on how to understand the language that elephants speak. Just as kids learn to talk, remember, they've got to learn how to trumpet and do all the same things. So it will be through body language. I think the, the most obvious one uh, in terms of, uh, obviously, a young calf trying to locate its mother will be sense of smell. I think that that plays a huge role. And then as they get older, then the communication uh, of the infrasounds will obviously come into play, but I don't think that they can necessarily understand it straight off, off the bat. Um, but for the first six months of a calf's life, it very rarely leaves mom's side. It's, it's normally right there, and mom doesn't normally let it out of her side. It's only just after they get a bit older, they start to get a bit braver, and they start venturing away from mom and spending more time following their older siblings around and playing with elephants of a similar age. But like I said, the first couple of months is sped really quite close to mom's side. I actually wonder if this calf is not a little bit older and it's just a late developer in terms of its tusks. Normally, you can start to see the tusks protruding at about two years old. And I can't even see that on this one, but it's very tall. I'm not going to, I'm just trying to think, yeah, maybe it's a bit older than a year and a half. Maybe it is closer to two, two and a half. And maybe it's just going to be a tuskless elephant. These types of things happen all the time. But definitely very thirsty little one. It also ha tried to have a drink of water because the tip of its trunk was wet and it's going to have a wet mouth now as well. Look how patient mom is being too. I mean she was moving when we found them but she s realizes that her calf is suckling and he needs to drink a certain amount of milk every single day too as well as him feeding on the vegetation but the bulk of his diet will still be milk at this age and she's tolerating him doing so. She's just feeding around her feet at the moment. But I don't think she'll stand still for too long, probably a couple more minutes before she's had enough and she will move on. It's very peaceful out here. Very quiet other than... Jackie, and that is how long do they suckle for? Not necessarily, sorry, the easiest to answer, but it, it's quite a complex... Uh, sort of answer to it because there, there's no sort of end date to how long they suckle for and the reason for this is because every four to five years or so an elephant will give birth that depends on what's going on with their in environment well the environmental status you know has there been a drought or is it flooding lots of rain is there abundance of food but um with these little ones, they'll suckle right through and, until mom is given or is about to give birth to another calf, and they're quite sneaky like that. But normally, it's for about the first three years of their life, and then mom starts to stop tolerating it. But they'll still be allowed to suckle, and then when mom's got a new calf, obviously she's still producing milk. When that all, when mom's not paying attention, maybe it's been a long day of travelling, and she thinks the young calf is suckling. Often it's not. It'll be the older one that sneaks in which is quite funny and that normally ends up in well sort of loud trumpets from the youngster throwing a tantrum and mom just saying nope you're too old for that that's quite funny as always, as always provides a lot of entertainment but let's go back across to Brent now in the Mara his lions seem to be up and moving around hopefully they're going to catch something well look at that isn't that gorgeous a ground hornbill flying into the sunset now, our lions were up and moving around, but unfortunately for them, the wildebeest decided to go a different way. But it is still a very pretty sight, that young lioness with the backlighting of the sunset. And we'll see the wildebeest stretching off. So those are the ones we saw, but they were followed the zebra and uh, I'm just walking on a line towards the mass that is off to the east of us. Richard's wondering why do zebra and wilde wildebeest hang out together? And it's quite simple, Richard. And uh, is that they... Oh, sorry, I just thought I heard something. Compliment each other. Um, so zebras are bulk grazers, they munch along, uh, and wildebeest are very picky grazers, so they prefer grass that has been munched on by something else first, 
Uh, and also just more eyes, less chance of being eaten by predators. Oh, it is absolutely gorgeous at this time of the day. Dina agreed the light on this grass is absolutely gorgeous. And you'll see how gorgeous it is on that lioness who's just watching a potential dinner disappear. Oh, while our lions watch wildebeest disappear, let's go all the way back to South Africa with a cute little baby elephant. We're still with our elephant friends and we're with a young calf that was suckling a moment ago and has now taken interest in some vegetation that's growing along the stump. What have you found? You got grass? Yes. Or are you looking for roots? What are you looking for down there? Whatever it is, it must be very tasty because he's spending quite a bit of time and he's focusing now. And he can use his trunk relatively well, he even try to throw a stick at one point. So he's definitely not too young, a little bit older than I thought. Sam, you're going to get your tusks developing late, so maybe you're not going to get them. I couldn't see any when he tilted his trunk up either. Look at those feet. Now, Alicia from Chicago, you've asked if elephants only give birth to one elephant at a time. I think twins can happen. I feel very sorry for an elephant car that is carrying twins. I, however, I don't think it's very common um, out here. I've never seen it personally, um, but there might be some other guides that have traveled different areas of Africa and have seen it. So it's like anything. Uh, it, it's possible, but for a big animal like this, I don't think it is. It's, it's as common as we think. And Pila and antelope, we actually see it quite often. Let's try to keep an eye out for that at the end of the year when the impalas start uh, uh, giving birth to their lambs. It'd be quite cool to see. But they're so placid. I can't believe the change in behavior of this herd of elephants from when we saw them at the beginning of the show and how they were charging away and they were out in the open to now in a more sort of denser area and completely relaxed. Stopping, feeding, behaving like elephants normally behave, which is quite nice. It's good to see that they can settle down. See that older calf is now also coming in to see. What was my sibling eating? Oh no, you're shaking your head at us. Hello. What are you doing? Are you going to come and say hello? Now, Matt, you were wondering if an elephant trunk continues growing for the whole of its life. Uh, not necessarily. If, I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but when an elephant is first born, its trunk is actually quite a far way away from the ground. And I think that's very clever of um, sort of the, the way that elephants grow because you've seen how clumsy those little ones are. They definitely step on their trunks constantly. So uh, it, I don't think it grows for their whole life. It obviously reaches a certain length. Uh, I reckon it grows quite quickly within the first few months of their life uh, and then it sort of st stops. But the tusks, you can see on this young elephant calf, those those will grow for their whole life. Obviously they grow quicker while they're younger and then as they get older that growth rate starts to slow down. They're now walking around past the car. Hi guys, come over here. We love you. We love to say hello. So you're not really too bothered and not really hanging around mom so much now either, moving off. You're going to go feed on some bush willows, but the uh, looks of it, are you going to break some branches? No, they're stopping and starting. It's actually a beautiful sunset as well. If you have a look just through here, we've got a very nice gap of the sunset and of these two little Ellie's quite close to us. Mom, see, Mom doesn't mind that they've gone behind the car. She'll follow slowly. She's talking to them. She had a very slow sort of rumble. And probably we should say, don't go too far. No, no. Elephants below the beautiful skyline. Love the Drakensberg Mountains. It's not hazy. It's nice and clear. It's nice out in the open. And I love the effect that those bush willows are creating. The Blue Mountains. 
This is so cool. What a nice afternoon it's turning out to be. Now I think what mom said to those elephants is actually get a move on, come back around the side. I don't trust that blonde bird in the car. But let's go to another friend of ours in the Mara, Brent. And I saw a picture of him the other day and it looks like his hair is starting to turn blonde too. Well, not quite as impressive as the Drakensberg, the Olololo escarpment, but still a beautiful backdrop for the sunset. And uh, sunsets seem always to be that little bit better if there are lions in them. And here we go, this young lioness, quite hungry, off on the prowl again. There are some wildebeest in that direction. The rest of the pride are still snoozing up high. She might go back to join them. Yanni wants to know, why do big cats groom and stretch and yawn before they hunt? Well, they generally are yawning uh, to get some oxygen into them. Uh, the stretching is obviously to get all the kinks, because often, often they'll sleep for many hours without moving. And the grooming uh, is quite an important social aspect of lion behavior, especially the aloe grooming, the grooming of each other. Uh, that uh, enables them to reaffirm the bonds of the pride. And being cats, they like to be relatively clean. Well, <laughs> a lion being clean is, as I said, a relative term. They are quite smelly things, but uh, they will groom as much as they can. So she's looking down. There are some wildebeest in that direction in the long grass. And just see their backs a little bit to the left. No, a little bit to the left, much closer. We just see their backs sticking out. There we go. Um, having a good graze and of course the lions prefer wildebeest and long grass as opposed to short grass but I'd say they're in a really good spot at the moment because from here they are able to go any direction and find themselves a good meal Okay, now the other cat's up on the hill. There's one head up, I think, just off to the, le uh, to the, the left of the, where the sun is setting. If we zoom in over there. There we go. There's a head up. Oh, it's the young boy whose head's up. And uh, hopefully they will get on the move shortly. Um, hi. And uh, as I said, uh, we are live in the, in the Mara. And uh, we're hoping this pride of lions heads out on the hunt in the not-too-distant future. Alicia, um, welcome. Alicia's wondering if they are possibly waiting for the sun to set before they set off on their hunt. Uh, well, not necessarily. Generally, lions do prefer to hunt in the hours of darkness, but they are like all predators opportunists and will take any opportunity uh, to hunt and there we go that young lioness is going to have a quick look at those wildebeest whose backs we saw just out of the back of the grass but as I think Alicia they will definitely probably all the rest of the pride will start moving as it gets darker and uh, she will probably fail we've seen quite a lot of that this year the younger lions are getting a little bit e over eager uh, in the big masses of wildebeest, they do have some success, but I think here on the peripheries of the bigger herds, she won't be as successful. See, looking back for support from the rest of the pride, who are still snoozing quite contentedly up on top of the hill. Uh, Laurie is wondering, is the hair, oh, we've got some vultures up there, uh, lapid faced, there's a Rupel's griffin, and it uh, looks like another lapid faced. Um, uh, Laurie's wondering if the hair on the wildebeest's neck is there to protect them from attacks by lions. Uh, Laurie, unfortunately, I don't think that hair is going to do much against lions, uh, with uh, it being quite, uh, quite, Sorry, excuse me, I lost my train of thought there, Laurie. Um, with a lot of that stuff, especially it's a completely different color, uh, it could be specifically in males to do with mating to signify the animal's in good condition. Um, oh, there we go. She's given up. Uh, the wildebeest are walking away. 
and, uh, and she's looking a little bit forlorn that none of the rest of the pride want to come help her out on her hunt. We can hear the wildebeest in the distance. Now, I've just got to do some flap repairs and things on this side. But the sun is disappearing. Uh, but as soon as these lions are up and mobile again, we'll come back. But till then, let's go see what Tristan's up to back in South Africa. just disappeared for four or five years. Where did that steamboat go? Now I was just trying to see if we couldn't get a visual of a steamboat, but that too has disappeared. So I don't know what's going on this afternoon, but everything I try and find just seems to move away from us, which is a little frustrating. But what is quite interesting is that unknown male leopard who I know some of you were trying to identify for one of the guys in Buffel's Hook has been seen again this afternoon with the female. So I don't know who the female is and I wonder if those aren't the tracks that Taylor had this morning up near Buffel's Hook boundary because it's straight north from where Taylor had the tracks and not too far off the boundary. But it is a male and a female lying there. I don't know who the female is yet. They haven't said. Maybe it's in Chile. It would be interesting if it is. But at least seems as though that unmale, unknown male is now starting to hang around because this is the third sighting of him in less than a week so hopefully he's going to stick around and it'll be interesting to see what happens and how that plays out because Mvula and Tingana and Gajima I'm sure are not going to be too thrilled with another male in their territory mating with their females that's for sure as if like I say as if we've had enough leopard drama is now going to add another male to the mix which should make things interesting but we've had a very quiet drive. We've seen absolutely nothing since you last saw us. We've just been driving around and trying to stop and listen, and there's been very little. There was a nice sunset for a little bit, but then yeah, that disappeared too. Roshni, you're wondering if inbreeding is a problem genetically for leopards? Well, Roshni, we addressed this yesterday, and it was basically the thing is, is that yes, it is a big problem if you have it multiple times um, in a row so let's say three four generations are inbreeding of inbreeding is happening then yes you're going to start seeing problems developing but if it's just once off then no the likelihood is okay let's see if this is going to stay because this is quite a cool picture I don't know if he is going to stay there but over there is the head of a warthog that is just sticking out of his mound now hopefully he's not going to go in right there Senzo on the mound thank you there we go now there's our warthog he's having a good relax and this warthog better be careful because I've seen Tundi on that particular mound twice and I've seen Tingana walk past there this week so oh there we go it's lost its nerve and run away now I feel awful because that's probably where it wanted to bed down for the night and me stopping where I have has caused it to run out of its burrow which is not ideal Oopsie. Right, so back to our leopard genetic story. So if they keep inbreeding, then yes, there'll be a problem. But if it's once or twice, then generally no, it's not going to be a problem. You, if you take cheetah, for example, so they have a few issues because of how inbred cheetah have become genetically. They're all very similar. The population declined too far and they've had to kind of use DNA from a small population to then regrow it. And that's why their genetics are not good and why they've succumbed to a lot of different issues but with the leopards once or twice won't be a problem so if you had a situation where let's say hypothetically quarantine mates with um, with Tandi or Shadow or Sh uh, Shongile it's not really going to be too much of a stress in that so you might I mean it's not ideal but it is not hugely probable that there's going to be a problem is it'll be fairly all right as long as it doesn't keep happening over and over and over again because that will definitely then weaken the genetic code right now I believe Taylor's meandered her way up and away from her elephants back towards Buffel's hook boundary I believe she's got some wallowing hippos 
We do have hippos. They're very sleepy at the moment, and they better get their act into gear now because it's not it's becoming night time and this is not the time for hippos to sleep this is the time for them to wake up and be fantastic but that doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon <laughs> they look very comfortable but you can also see how bubblesook dam is drying out quite a bit now and um, it's obviously fairly shallow around there their bodies exposed although on a day like today that's actually quite a nice spot to have a bit of water to keep you cool but also to have your backs exposed and let the sun's rays warm them up quite nicely so they look very comfortable but it's getting chillier now so perhaps they'll come out yes you're giving us the evil eye aren't you are you going to splash around that's the blue steel look that the hippo love to give us oh the other one's opening its mouth that was a surprise <laughs> from fast asleep to wide awake how's that now you're gonna roll around you tricked us hey Seb yeah. how's that Is hippo leading you on to go to the other one because it's not doing anything sneaky very very sneaky now Now, unfortunately, the gremlins have come in once again, so we are back with us. And I was just speaking to Andrew, trying to work out which female he's got on Biffle's hook with that unknown male, and hoping to kind of get an answer as whether it's Shongile or if it's Nchila or who's up there. He says he's not sure it might be Tundi, but I would be very surprised if Tundi was all the way north like that. I suppose it's possible, but it would be a very big surprise to me if she had headed up that way. So now I'm gonna try and just I'm just trying to check anywhere roughly where we've had tracks and the hope that these leopards have decided to start moving. We know that yesterday when we were sitting with Shongila and Hosanna, it was now was the time that Tandi showed up, so she was moving at around this time. So, hopefully, if we're going to find leopard, now's the time to do it, and we're going to get lucky, and one of them is going to appear somewhere. Lovey Lori, you're wondering if Shongila would take the territory from Tandi. Well, if she was strong enough, and she could, most certainly she'll push Tundi. And leopards are like that. They try and push and push and push as much as they can to get as big a territory as possible. And the stronger they are and the, the more they're able to sort of dominate other females, the more likely they are to end up with a territory bigger and, and, and of their own. So she, if she could manage it and she could out-muscle Tundi, then most certainly she would try. And I wouldn't be surprised if in latter years we see that at the end of the day Tandi remember is a lot older than what Shongile is she's got quite a few years so there's a bit of experience that counts there but as Tandi gets a little bit older so her body starts to break down a little bit it becomes harder and tougher for her and that then opens the door for a younger fitter female of Shongile maybe when she reaches three four years old she can then start really challenging and pushing and trying to then take back some of that territory or at least push Tundi out of her own territory. And we've seen it with a few females. Safari is one. She ended up becoming pushing way out of where she originally started. She originally started around Elephant Plain Simomili, and by the time she died, she was hanging around around Chitwa and Nets, Little Gari. That's where she kind of finished up. So it was a big move from her pushing more towards the east as she got older, and her daughters and varying other females got stronger and stronger. Right, well, I believe Brent is still with his lions. I wonder if they're still eyeing those wildebeest on the horizon, but I'm sure he will be able to tell you exactly what's been going on, and let's hope there's a bit of action around the corner. There we go. There's a bit of movement up from the other lions on top of the ridge. Our lone lioness is still staring at wildebeest down the road, but the rest of the pride seem to be heading in the opposite direction to her. Who's that? Is that the young boy? Yep, the young boy. 
Oh, let's go with our lonely lioness. She's going on the hunt all by herself. So she's just slipped in there, heading towards those wildebeest backs we saw a little earlier. Who knows, maybe she could get lucky. So you can just see her ears there. Now you can see how that little bit of grass cover really goes a long way. Wildebeest are not aware of her presence as of yet, but it definitely would be a bit easier if the rest of the pride came and gave her a hand. <laughs> Nancy says there's always one. Well, I suppose she's just that a little bit more hungry than the rest. Now I'm just going to reposition slightly so I can... Uh, Alicia says, amazing how patient these guys are. Um, they are very, very patient creatures. Um, even the young ones, but I'm just repositioning... S oh, uh, the guides. Well, thank you very much, I Alicia. Um, I just want to see if I can make sure where the rest of the pride are behind me and see her at the same time. There she is. I can hear the wildebeest in the distance. No this distance they sound like frogs or they sound like wildebeest there we go the wind is blowing that sound towards us moment she's looking the wrong way because that's down towards the short grass where she'll be spotted in a matter of seconds. Okay, I'm going to go check what the rest of the pride are up to while we do that. Tristan has got a big-eyed bird of the night. Well, we've found ourselves a little owl. I'm not sure which one it is just yet. It looks like a barred owlet from here. It doesn't seem to have the black on the back of the head, although I might be wrong. It's difficult. It's silhouetted against the light, and it's at that phase now where the spotlight is not quite bright enough to illuminate things properly. It could be a pill spotted. Difficult. Hopefully it's going to turn his head a little bit for me and it'll give me a better idea. It does have quite a spotty back and we can't see the chest which is generally also an easy way to determine them. But it's watching something in the grass. I wonder if it's not seen something. No, it is a pill spotted. There we go. We can see the little black tufts on the back of the head. So a pill spotted owlet. And these guys are very active at this time of the night. So you find them coming out in dawn and dusk and they move around and they'll be hunting small birds, bats. Apparently they go after quite a lot, which is quite interesting. And insects and off it goes, flying away. Well, at least it sat around long enough to get a nice view of it, which is good news. We've had a plethora of owls recently. It's been quite amazing. We've had 
Taylor had that amazing Veroz Eagle Owl sighting a few mornings ago. There's been scops owls around, barred owlets, pearl spotted owlets, and even the little white faced owls have been around. I had a white faced owl the other day, and as we started driving, we were busy framing it up, and it then flew away, unfortunately. I was hoping we'd get them on camera because I love the little white faced owls. They beautiful and they've got those bright big orange eyes that are so eerie looking particularly if you see them at night so it would be really nice to uh, get one of those on camera again and hopefully I'll check around that area where I saw it, it was not too far from Treehouse Dam so I will have a little scan around there again at some stage and try to see if we can't find them Gary, you want to know if there's any ground creatures that will hunt owls and other birds? Well, yes, there is. All the cats, pretty much, will go after birds. So you'll find things like leopard, lion, um, you'll find caracal, serval, wildcat, genet, civet, um, what else, mongoose. They'll all go after birds when they can, and, and even small owls like that. Then you'll find that there's snakes that will go after them, lizards will go after the chicks. So they have a tough life, owls. They also have a lot of predators of their own, even though they predate on things. They also have a lot of predators that they have to look out for on their own accord. So it's not easy life when you're a predator. Everyone always thinks that the predators have it much easier, but they don't. They've also got a lot to deal with and a lot of animals to watch out for and keep their young safe and themselves safe. So owls definitely have a number of ground-based predators. Alicia, you're wondering if it's true if they can turn their entire head around. It is true, Alicia. You will find them turning their head all the way that they, at some stage, will have the back of their head to you, and then they can turn, and you will see the front of their head. So they pretty much can turn. They can't turn it right around in the 360, but they can turn it so that the eye's on the back and then round or the other way. So it's pretty incredible to actually watch those guys turning their heads. It's quite a weird thing to see, but it's very, very cool. And that's why you'll see on that pearl spotted eyelid, it had the two black dots on the back of the head. So whenever it turns or whenever it looks, there's nothing that can come and get it from behind because they all think that those are eyes that are on the back and therefore they don't try to fly in and grab them. It's a very clever system that they've got. We're just coming back towards Vuyatela Dam or Gari Dam now just to try and check out what's happening and see if maybe, just maybe, something has emerged in the cover of darkness. I don't know if it has, but we're going to try and I'll do one more little loop around Ingwe Alley and then see if there's not something there. Joy Ann, you want to know which owl is the biggest and which owl is the smallest? Oh, that's a nice reflection. Hold on two seconds. So before we get into the biggest and smallest, there's a reflection of an impala just on the water surface here. There we go. How beautiful is that? Perfect, perfect reflection. That is very cool. It's about as good a reflection as you're ever going to get as it drinks in that evening light. You can see there's a little bit of yellow still in the light itself as it picks up off the sky. But very cool. A beautiful impala ram. Now there are quite a few other impalas around. I wonder if we're not going to get a line of them that's going to come and drink and we'll have a reflection of all of them. You can see some of them just moving off to my right hand side so there we go there's a whole bunch of them there obviously not going to shine my light on them for too long given that it's uh, a diurnal species and we don't really want to actually blind them anyway but here comes the rest i think they're all going to start lining up we might get a nice big line of reflections look at that isn't that magnificent that's really cool it just goes to show there's even beauty in the most common of animals that we see out here. It almost looks a bit surreal as though there's a tear in space or a smudge over a picture and they're now just moving through that clear part of the picture. That's very cool. But back to our owls while we just appreciate our impalas and their reflection. So the largest owl that we see here is the Veroz Eagle Owl which is a very large bird. It's the one that Taylor had a few mornings ago that I was referring to. You'll find that owl can get large. I think it weighs about 5 kilograms. I'll just check now and make 100% sure. But somewhere around there, which for a bird is very heavy, 
And then the smallest owl we get is the one you just saw now, which is the pearl spotted owlet. So that's why it's called an owlet. It's a lot smaller. In fact, actually, the pearl spotted and I forgot about the scops owl. The scops owl is about a similar size. In fact, the scops owl doesn't get quite as large, if I remember correctly, as the pearl spotted. Let me just check. So yes, the scops owl weighs between 60 and 80 grams and the pearl spotted 60 to 100 grams. So the pearl spotted on the upper end gets bigger, but they're both on the lower end are very similar. So those are our two smallest owls. And then our biggest one is the Verose eagle owl, which... So, sorry, it gets to three kilograms, not five, which is about right, actually, when I think about it, because martial eagles are close to five kilograms. Well, that was absolutely beautiful. Sorry, on part, <laughs> I don't mean to give you all a fright. I think me speaking slightly louder has given everybody a bit of a jump. You can hear baboons shouting now as well. I wonder if there's not something hanging around. But we're going to quickly watch what goes on and listen to these baboons and see if they shout again. And while we do that, let's go back to Brent and his lions in the Mara. Well, the mail is up and the sun is going down. The rest of the pride have moved further to the south of us. But there's one very cool thing I just wanted to show you. There's a flying ants coming out of the black mound. Look at that. All that rain we've been having is spurred on an allate emergence. But we are going to switch now onto infrared. So we can see more of what's going on as the light fades. So let's have a look at those termites in infrared. Should be able to see a bit more. Here we go, little black mound termite alates. Now quite often they will come out at dusk or in the night and the, one of the main reasons for that is they are such popular food sources and uh, there's a, a few less birds out at night uh, who can munch on them also a few less mammals but it seems they're already under attack look at that there's a, ants that are attacking them before they can even take off they are such a high protein meal that everyone wants a bite of a termite. They are quite yummy as well. Tastes a bit like peanut butter. And of course an incredible source of protein. So this looks to be like one of the males that we see also with the Salt Lake Pride, which is quite interesting because it does become very confusing, all the different <laughs> lions around here. Hi Gary, Gary's wondering if we get art fox hunting ants. Well, I have seen an art fox that was out hunting termites and ants, uh, who then in turn got hunted by lions, but managed to escape and run down a hole. Now let's go a little bit forward and see where the rest of the pride got to. Where is my illumination device? There it is. Oh. This is the one direction I was hoping they would not go in. <laughs> Alicia says, do I know what peanut butter tastes like? She doesn't believe me. I do indeed. I've eaten peanut butter. I would just go to say, well, it's not quite as, as a peanut as peanut butter, but it's a, a similar sort of flavor. As you can see, it's got a bit nippy got my trusty red shuka. This is my oldest shuka. I've had this one for over eight, nine, ten years. Um, it was given to me by my security staff, my anti-poaching staff, when I left Tanzania. So if I had to pick a favorite, it's probably going to be this one. Ah, there we go. Looks like some of the rest of the bride have stopped for a little break. And we are not going to stick with these. This looks like, yes, it is the two young boys. 
next to us here. And uh, they look like they are doing, oh no, they're also going to move. But the girls look to be approaching a pride, a pride, a herd of wildebeest over there. Gonna freewheel down the road. The wildebeest are there. During a specific mating season or at any time of the year. You can just have a look in the road in front of us, man. I want to see where those girls are. Uh, the front one, uh, more, okay, I'm just having a look where she is. Um, well, James, no, lions uh, will mate throughout the year, but only when the females are in estrus. Into a good... Let's go to Tristan, who still haven't, hasn't managed to find... Now, we're just trying to get a better view of another little owlet, and I think it's again a pearl spotted, so hopefully from this angle we should be able to see it nicely. Senzo, how's that? There it is. So another little pearl spotted owlet. You can see those black dots that I was talking about on the back of the head. When it turns in there, you're asking about how, if it can turn its head all the way. That was a pretty good example of just how far the head can turn. So there's the black dots. Are you calling for us? David, you want to know if owls hunt bats? Well, I believe that these guys do sometimes go after bats. I've, I've never seen it myself, and i am certainly never seen one feeding off it, but I believe that they can hunt bats from time to time. So it's quite interesting that they do. I would love to see footage of it if they do actually hunt bats, because, as like I say, I've never actually seen it, and I've never seen one even feeding off a bat at this stage. So... Hopefully, I will be able to uh, one day see that. It will be really cool to see one of them going after bats and catching one. Now, the baboons are still alarm calling. I, I've driven all the way around and tried to sort of see where they're looking, but they just run from me when I drive. So difficult to say exactly where they're looking. Maybe they're seeing around towards Galago. So I'm just going to go around to the other side of of the camp and check Gallego Pan quickly. Maybe that leopard that Taylor saw this morning is out and about. But the baboons are definitely not happy about something. They're shouting and carrying on. And one individual that's really making a noise more than the others. It doesn't sound like one of the big males either. You can normally hear the big males. They make a very deep, loud grunt. Whereas this is a, quite a high pitch sound. So I'd imagine one of the females or younger ones that's seen something. But they were quite lively when I drove past. They all ran across the roof and towards Yuri's house and and then they started shouting again when I was close by there watching the owl. So hopefully whatever's moving around is still out in the open and we'll actually be able to find it because it would be nice to finish the day with the last minute leopard as we often talk about. So now I believe while we looking for a spotted cat in the night. Brent Leo Smith is still with his lines and they are now getting into some serious hunting mode. Well, that front lioness is very, very close to a herd of wildebeest now. The rest of the pride, and the reason we're so far away from her is the rest of the pride have sort of blocked our way. There we go. There's one. And there's another one lying right next to us there in the drain. Two, actually. Now, remember, I can't... It's pitch black around us, and I'm watching ex the exact same picture that you are through the monitor. 
I wonder if they're going to get spotted or they're going to be successful. Oh dear, the lead lioness is laid down. And let's have a look at the wildebeest. There's the closest wildebeest we can just make out there. Yeah, so there's a fair few there, a couple of hundred at least. The wind is not in their favor though from here. You can see the wind blowing in from the east towards the west, taking the scent of those lines straight to the wildebeest. Now, it always depends on how those wildebeest react from that scent. Um, Phoenix says, how can I see where I'm going? Well, I just drive by feel. No, of course I'm joking. So there's a little bit of light that I can make out where the road is from the grass at the moment. But and the lines, I can't see at all. So, I mean, I can actually just make out there's one there and just see her. But the ones that are down in the road ahead of me, I can't see at all. And there's another one right next to us coming from behind. Hello. Just heard the sneeze. She gone. She's gone that way. Or maybe she's deciding that's not worth hunting. Let's creep a bit further forward. Hello, girly. Just, are there wildebeest also to the left of us here that I didn't see earlier in the long grass? Yes, there are. Now, I didn't even see those. Are they disappearing already? Now, they're just running around being normal wildebeest. Brandon wants to know, what is the temperature right now? Oof, it's quite pleasant. It's a little bit chilly. I'd say probably around 20 degrees Celsius. Maybe a little bit less. No, but no, definitely 20, 22. Not too cold. I'm not a big fan of the cold. Decisions, decisions. Wildebeest to the left of me, wildebeest to the right. Only there's a lioness walking right past us. Or was it the young male? I can't see in the dark. No, it's a big girl. There she goes. Another one on the left, right next to us. You can just hear it pacing through the grass. Ah, it's one of the young boys. Oh, look out there further to the, is that another lion? That's another one of the young boys. So there's two young boys here. Could they help and aid in this hunt by chasing the wildebeest onto the girls? No, I can't just get, I go from those boys to the right a little bit. I just want to see how far the wildebeest are. You see them now could be a bit far okay we're gonna move around a little bit down the road um, and while we do that let's go see what Madame McCurdy is up to how exciting is that hopefully those lions continue to creep closer and closer to the wildebeest now it's been fairly quiet We've had a couple of gremlins attacking us for the last couple of minutes. What we did see, though, was a genet up in a tree, but we were down in a very bad spot, and then it also ran away. But it's, it's quite nice now. We seem, seem to be seeing genets, well, uh, maybe not necessarily putting them up on screen, but definitely seeing them more often. So this is exciting. Our winter creek starts with 
because the vegetation is down, down to a point that we can actually see them. So I'm looking forward to white-tailed mongoose. Now, Gary, wondering what on earth is a gremlin? Well, is a word that we use just to, to uh, describe the technical uh, issues that we can sometimes have. They, they're various types of gremlins. We get the wind ones. We've discovered what the wind gremlin was, by the way. Our antenna at Chitwa, um, after all that gale force, when she was blown over sideways. So that explains the signal issues with Wainly Wainly of the cars that will go towards Chitwa, but that will hopefully be resolved in the next few days. Um, could be from the stream not working, so a lack of internet in camp, you know, sometimes that goes down. There's quite a difficult process, of course, to bring you these feeds. I mean, it's one thing bringing you, uh, bringing you a feed from South Africa. It's a whole other story coming from Kenya. Uh, so, so it's quite, quite interesting. So the, we just give them the word sort of gremlins. Um, but we try and keep them at bay as often as we can. Now, Tristan's having some luck with owls. We've obviously had our turn. We were very lucky where we saw a pearl spotted owl of Anna Varosi owl in the last few days. I wonder what else we have for the last 10 minutes of the show. I wouldn't mind anything really. I'd love to see, like I said, a white tailed mongoose would be good. Even a porcupine. Oh, when last did we see a porcupine other than the one that Mvula was eating a couple of weeks ago? Um, Mvula is one of the male leopards that we get to see every now and then. And so, it's, yeah, Juma's quiet today, but that's all right. I know what's going to happen is we're going to end the show and the leopards are going to come out in full force. Sounds like there's also some lions that have been found, but I think that's on... Torchwood side, if I'm not mistaken, or in Buffalo's Hook, probably the Torchwood Pride. No word just yet of the Nkuhumas. They'll be around somewhere. They'll eventually come back. They must be on a kill. I would also only explain why no one has seen them for some time. I don't even know what road we are on. I think we're on Zoe's Road and we should pop out on quarantine. Well, that was the idea anyway. We're scanning up in the trees down on the ground. I think it's too chilly to find chameleons, but I'm looking down in the lower lying branches as well, but no luck just yet. But it seems as though lions are back on the move, edging closer towards those wildebeest. So let's go back to Brent in Kenya. Oh, they are indeed. Now they're surrounded by wildebeest, but they're not showing any sign of serious intent towards the herds just yet. Look off to the right. There are some wildebeest there. I'm not sure how far off they are. I can hear them. There we go. There, the wildebeest. Now, Goeds would like to know how does the wind affect hunting? Uh, well, it can be to advantage uh, to the the lion's advantage if they hunt into the wind. But I'm afraid they don't really seem to think like that. Um, they just hunt what's in front of them regardless of where the wind is. There's a lion about to walk past on our left. I can hear something in the grass. Not quite with us just yet. And the wind has suddenly decided to blow much, much harder. A young male lagging at the back. There's another young male somewhere behind us. I think that's the last one that's coming through. Unfortunately, it seems I'm having a bit of a problem with my radio. But someone was asking, there's the other young male. They seem to, I can't, I'm afraid I can't hear who the name, but they seem to stick close. Phoenix. Felix, oh, well, there goes the hunt. Two boys jumping on each other. Every wildebeest around has spotted them now. But Felix, um, they do tend to uh, sometimes stick to the roads. It's nice and easy to walk on. Uh, it's like a really big elephant path. But yeah, there goes the hunt after those boys jumping on each other. And you can, 
I can hear it, but I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it, but the snort <laughs> of uh, the wildebeest after spotting the lions. And you can see the whole body language has changed completely. Well done, little rascals. You ruined that properly. Okay, I'm afraid. I, Manu, did you get that? No. I think we're in one of these very funny spots. There's a few of them about where we lose all radio comms and Kirsten comes through like an alien. Although that's what Kirsten sounds like normally anyway. But I think the hunt is over. Ah, this lioness is just going to walk off to join. I'm going to keep following them for a little bit. See if anything comes from it. So while we do that, uh, let us send you back to uh, Tristan in South Africa. Well, we had a hard stopping moment there for a second. There was a bushbuck that was lying down with its head down on the ground and I thought maybe it was a leopard staring at us from the back end of the dam and we drove there and then a bushbuck popped up and that was that. So I thought maybe, just maybe we had found our leopard, but wherever this leopard is that's causing the baboons or whatever is causing the baboons to be upset, it's not near a road. I've done an entire loop around the camp from the roads that I can access and I can't find any sign of a predator anywhere there. So it may be somewhere between the camp or at least in the drainage sections, I don't know. But there's certainly nothing from visible from a road, which is I suppose the way it goes. But the baboons are still upset, they're still shouting every now and then. There's still something that is piquing their interest and certainly getting them on a little bit of edge, I would imagine. Well, getting them on edge. There we go. I can speak English at some point today. It's been one of those days. Hello, scrub here. I think you're, you're far better off than your cousin in the Masai Mara that was next to a whole bunch of lions. But I don't... There we go. Although I suppose there's a number of predators out here too, from all the owls and leopards and very other types of animals that run around here at night. So I suppose they're not better off than the Mara ones. Just at this present moment, I think they're better off here than the ones there. Well, that particular one and this particular one. Uh, but at this stage, unfortunately, no other signs that we can pick up. It's been a tough day at the office, so to speak. We've driven around, we've found tracks everywhere that we could imagine yet we just haven't been able to turn up the goods and it goes that way yesterday i suppose we got so spoiled we can't really complain about it and we've had such a good week with cats that it is the way it is and so it's how it goes what we have managed to find is a blonde maned lioness that is slowly creeping you can see its lights in the distance it likes to drive around with lights on so there it is in front there it goes now behind those lights there you can actually see the blonde mane glowing in the background look this so Tula Ann while we watch Taylor who's not an elephant you want to know if elephants ever come up close past the car and scream and give us a fright well Tula Ann sometimes they do look there's Taylor waving see she's got her queen wave out this afternoon but Sometimes they do to land, they come close and then they trumpet and you get a bit of a fright, particularly if they're behind you or next to you in some way, then you can often get a fright from the elephant. So it's a funny thing when Ellie's are around is that you, when they do trumpet very, very loudly, it's so loud that you get a little bit of a fright, but it's not that often. At least sometimes we see them from far away and if they trumpet far away, then it's not so scary. It's just when it's very, very close, like you say, that you can get a bit of a fright. Right, well, we're going to follow Taylor slowly towards home because home is in that direction and <coughs> given that we've had a tough day I think home is where we need to head just to rest up for the night and hope that tomorrow is a better day <coughs> now excuse me I'm half choking to death I think I swallowed an insect there which is not ideal it certainly <laughs> has gone down the wrong way that's for sure 
Now, it is that time of the day, unfortunately, where we do have to say goodbye to all of you. I think Brent might still be out this evening for a little bit. I'm not sure. Haven't really heard, so... I know the Mara guys do do some nocturnal stuff, so I'm hoping they will be out. But just keep an, up, an eye on your updates. I'm sure it will come up if they are out. But myself and Taylor, like I say, we're heading back to camp. We're going to try and go and rest up for tomorrow. So from Senzo, Seb, Taylor, and myself, Megan and FC and Kirsty in the Mara, thank you everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari.